Hello everybody, good afternoon. My name is Denta and you are watching The Denta Show. I know that you guys have been eagerly waiting for this show because you all want to know about real estate, about buying a property in Ghana, about, you know, women who are in this field, you know, that really never get promoted for what they are doing. And tonight we are shining a spotlight on all of these fantastic women and what they do and why they decided to get into the property field. So thank you very much for joining me today. I hope that last week you enjoyed the raising strong female leaders in our community. We had Roberta Annan on, we had um, Anita Erskine, we had Renee Q, we had Ebony, we had so many fantastic women um, on the platform sharing their experiences about how women can lead and how we can support each other in the community. So I think it's really important um, that as women, we support each other that when you are in a certain position, you pull your sister up as you are going up into the field. And so thank you so much for joining me on The Dentar Show tonight. And I must say a big thank you to people who are sponsoring my show. I mean, it's fantastic when, you know, you start off your, your live show and people just jump on board and say, you know what, Denta, um, I want to be a part of this. And can you promote my product for me? So a big thank you to Cassie's Classics, for this amazing, she's done her own um, all-purpose seasoning and she's done her own pepper sauce and shit off. She's a 25 year old. She started when she was 24 and decided to make these products during lockdown and she's doing fantastically well. And I wanted to promote her. So Cassie, well done. You can go on to her website. I will set, I, I'll put it out on my um on my comments box and you can go and order one. I mean, she's doing so well. She's got even jollof seasoning. I know you guys want to have that, some of that jollof seasoning. For those that don't know how to do the jollof well, if you use her seasoning, boom, you're gone. It's going to be fantastic. And again, I want to say a big thank you to Vesta London Beauty for her lip gloss, her lip glaze, as she calls it. Thank you so much for supporting the Denta show. And, you know, I've got a beautiful necklace by... Ahinima, she is Dorothy that makes these necklaces. She's based in the UK. This is Sankofa. Um, she does all of the, you know, Jinyame necklaces. And I just want to say a big thank you to Dorothy. You can find her um, on Instagram. It's A-H-I-M-A underscore jewelry. And I'm wearing it today. I hope that you like it. We're promoting, you know, these SMEs that are doing well in our community. And so, yep. You're ready for the show? Let me know where you are watching the Denta show from. Where are you? Are you in London? Are you in Ghana? Where are you right now? Let me hear from you. Um, and I also want to say a big thank you to Tap Tap Send. If you aren't using Tap Tap Send, you need to make sure you're using Tap Tap Send. All you have to do is download the app, okay? And use the promo code DENTA and you get five pounds to give to a loved one. Um, but I'm going to kick off the show. Before I, I get the women onto the show, I've got a man, the only man of the show, okay? And he's somebody that joined us at the Goober Careers. His name is Mr. James Dadson. He's at the Land Commission. And he's a very good friend of mine now, Mr. Azor. I mean, you know, we've become very good friends. And really, it's to enlighten you on lands issues or you know how to go about getting land in Ghana so please welcome our first one hi James uh oh James can you hear me I can't seem to hear you I can see you, but I can't hear you. Uh oh. You may have to log back in and then test your. Oh, I heard something. Hello? Hello, James? No, I can't hear you. Okay, let's see if we can get uh, James back on. You might have to log on. You might have to log off and log back on.
let's see if he can try and log back in. Okay, so I was just telling my, my beautiful ladies um, that, you know, I bought a property when I was 21 years old. And, um, you know, it was one of those things where my dad actually encouraged me. He was like, you know, this is something that you can, you can get into. Um, and I was very skeptical of getting it, but I think it was one of the best moves I had ever done. Now we have a young lady. Let me see. Is that James back on? Oh, let's see. Oh, no. Is this James? No, this is Kieran. Oh, I've lost, I've lost James. Okay. So, um, but we have a young lady called Stephanie Wilson who, you know, decided actually that she's going to go into real estate at a very, very young age. And I'm going to get her to introduce herself, tell you exactly what she's doing and how, why she got into that field. So welcome on stage, Stephanie. Hi, Steph. Hi. How are you? I'm fine. Good evening. Good evening. Can you put your camera up so we can see your face? Can you tilt it a little bit? Perfect. Perfect. How are you? I'm doing well. How about awesome. you? I'm fine. Thank you, Steph. Steph, tell me a little bit about your company um, and when you decided to go into real estate. Okay. So my company is um, Upper Crest Ghana. First there was Count Properties, but then there were some changes made. Mm -hmm. um, we are into property development and management and into technology, real estate technology as well, like the home automations and security system installations. Okay. Right? Um, I decided to get into real estate at a very young age. Mm -hmm. And the age I, I was 17. 17 years old when you got into yeah. real estate. Yes. And I that mean, when I actually got into real estate, but before I entered secondary school, mm -hmm. I had already had plans to get into real estate. I always thought uh, of having a generation that would have a wealth laid down, a well uh, laid down foundation. For them so before i went to school i already had plans to save and invest in real estate i wanted to buy my first house right after secondary school wow and was that an encouragement from your family like was your family into real estate because you know like how did you get into it nothing like that uh, i i read a lot on the internet my mom brought us this tablet i would always read on the internet i would see people doing good in real estate and i remember i asked my dad about it and i got to know my stepdad was into it okay. so then yeah we started from there so at 17 you saved up money yes i saved up money but then it wasn't up to my expectation to be able to even acquire land okay so what process did you have to go through to even acquire land um so let me say this, that uh, from what I realized, I realized you have to learn before you can even earn. So in my secondary school days, when I picked my interest in that, I, I, I was able to meet people that I could learn from. I started working for Mr. Frank when I was still in um, secondary school. Whenever we have a vacation, I have to come to my uncle in Accra, right? So I was learning under him. And then I was saving some money till I had my mom in a conversation with one of her friends in Spain who was complaining about um, her siblings spending the money and overcharging her for putting up a property in Kumasi. Mm. So I, after the call, I was on a video call with my mom when she was in the kitchen and I overheard that conversation. So I told my mom, do you know I can help her build only if she wants to build in Accra? And my mom was like, hey, you would day. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so before my mom could even talk to her i had already spoken to my boss that i'm bringing someone on board okay? wow so i had that um, client acquisition campaign and then i was able to convince her i'm really good at um, uh, marketing at a certain pitch where you would you would easily fall in for me mm. Right. So that was what I did to her, and then she agreed she would want to build in Accra. Since whenever she's in Ghana, 
she stays in these expensive apartments in Accra. So then she was ready to let us build for her. And then we did that. And that led to another client who happens to be her brother. Wow. So you started off basically using like a family member. Yes. To start off, you know, um, as like a, as a tester into the in, into the industry, and exactly. so far, how many how many buildings or how many apartments have you built so far? Um, so this is from her. It has been a custom home um, development, you know. So we I've done for the brother and the brother's friend, and then when I came online posting my works and everything, I had extra two, and now. Um, I have a project I would want to come up with apartments that okay. I'm working on. And which areas are you focusing your 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 buildings? In Where Accra, are you doing it? Um, I started from with her. I started from Hacho, Westland, okay. right? So I want to get into Cantonments, Jolu, Laboni, and then I uh, the other one is at Dawinya. So those are the areas I have. Okay. Tried. Okay, let me see. I think we have Mr. James back on. Hi, James. Oh, I keep losing James. Okay, he's gone. Um, and how was it like acquiring land? Because I wanted to speak to the Lands Commission about it. How was it actually going about acquiring the land? Or did the people already have their land so you didn't have to worry about that? No, she didn't have a land. Okay. Okay. So uh, the first project that happens to be my mom's friend, uh, my boss had that land at Hatcho, Westland. That was where we had the land. So I had to talk to him. He had, to, uh, it was it was an acre, mm -hmm. right? So, but then I had to bargain mm -hmm. for 100 by 70 from him. Okay. And then he went through all the processes with me. Okay. And do you think that the, the process move? Yes, it, it did. It, it's quite hectic. You know yeah even even going in with the design for it to be accepted it's, it's one hell of a thing mm. Mm. Yeah. now that you talk about design i think i'm going to bring nane kriya on who is an architect um one of the female leading architects in ghana and in africa i would say um people are not making enough noise about her as i want um, and she is somebody that's, you know, every building that I've seen that she's done is incredible. Um, but actually, let me see. I think James is back. Hi, James. Hello. Oh, yay. <laughs> Even though we can't see your face properly because it's really dark, but I will take it like that uh, now. Okay. How are you, James? All right. I'm very well. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. I was just talking to Stephanie about she... I mean, she started doing real estate at the age of 17. Um, she started off, you know, building for her family members and, you know, delved into recommendations from her family members and is now, you know, upscaling and has built her business. But one of the challenges that she was saying is that, you know, land acquisition, land issues was one of the biggest hurdles that, she, you know, they have to go through. So what would you say for somebody, you know, people in the diaspora, that are looking to buy land do they just follow you know you know when you go to ghana you see land for sale on 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 the building um do you follow that or do you come to the lands commission to see if there's a list of lands available that you could possibly buy Oh, let me see. Hi, James. Did you get my question? No, I missed. I missed all of that. If you can. Okay. So, somebody from from the diaspora who is, you know, wanting to buy land in in Ghana um, has come to Ghana. Has seen on a building land for sale. Do they follow that land for sale number and call them, or is there a a, a place at the land commission that that you can go and find a list of land that you can purchase? uh thank you very much so you can you can actually follow that telephone number okay and but when you go you have to be given documents covering that property okay 
and then with those documents you will take them to the lands commission and you'll be advised on what is on so for example you can have a property up for sale in airport residential area and in airport they are all government lands and they are on this whole basis so it's a an interest that will terminate at a point okay james can you hear me hello hi james yes you were saying hello are you back yes yeah can you hear me yes i can hear you now can you hear me now yes i can hear you i can hear you i can hear you james so typically typically somebody wanting to buy to buy land hello. how long yes is the so they would they would check mm -hmm. Yes. Let me see. Let me see if we can get James back. I know that it's probably raining in Ghana. Nana, is it raining in Ghana? Nod your head and let me know. Is it raining? No, it's not. Okay, so I bet he's using Vodafone or the MTN or Airtel or one of these airline, one of these <laughs> telecoms. We won't mention which one it is, but it's one of them definitely. I'm hoping that he will come back on so he can answer some of these questions that everybody has on land issues. Um, you know, you know, I want to know typically what you know how long it takes to actually you know get the process done of purchasing a land i know that i'm sure that you know um genevieve and even nana will have you know some knowledge on that because they deal with that on a regular basis um but let's see let's see if we're able to get james back on if we are not we're going to move on very swiftly um to nana the architect and also a developer herself um, so please welcome Nana Ekuya. Hi. Hi, Nana. Hello, Denta. How are you? I'm very well. How are you two? I'm fine, thank you. So, Nana, I mean, when we talk about architects, usually it's kind of for men, you know, we don't really hear a lot of women in that field. And so yeah. what made you, you know, go into that field? Okay, so... Um, Unfortunately, my, my story about how I get I got into architecture is it's a little unconventional. Um, my mother blackmailed me. <laughs> really? Wow. <laughs> so so um, yes, there is that. But of course, Mama knows this. In the end, it's like I can't imagine doing anything else mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I'm an artist first of all, artist mm -hmm. at heart. And so, um, of course, and you were saying, whenever you've seen any project and of I, mine. Hold on one second. I think James is back on because he can't stay long. So let me see. Yeah. James, can you hear me? Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. So um, if you can answer that yeah. question for me. I know you don't have long, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get you on so we can answer the questions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I, I was saying that uh, for all properties in Ghana, we have different uh, types of interest, as in what title you can get if you buy property. So for government land, you only have a leasehold, so which has maximum of 99 years. Okay. Same with the, the two lands. Then for family lands and private lands, you could get a freehold interest, that is you have it forever. Okay. Um, yes, or they also can also give leases. So if, if you get a property, the fact that a person has title over the land, you have to go beyond that to check how many years um, is remaining on that, that particular um, piece of property. So you can have a property in airport which originally had 99 years, but it's run and we are left to say 30 years to go. You, you have to be mindful of that when you're going to buy that kind of property. So you should know that you have only 30 years to go and in 30 years you have to go and renew it and buy the entire thing land and building from government so that is why it is essential that you go and check so that they can interpret to you what interest you are going to acquire if you buy that kind of property and then also you want to buy land for a particular use so you need to be sure 
from the Land Use and Special Planning Authority or from the District Assembly where the land is situated, uh, what type of user that land can uh, can be put to. So you can have a land for residential use, land for um, commercial use, land for educational use. So all of these you must know before you part with money for any any piece of property. And and typically, I know that even for myself, uh, you know, you, you try to do the process, but the process seems to be very very long. And um, typically, how long is it supposed to take for for you know buying a land in in, in Ghana? So it also depends on what you are buying. If I am selling my land to you and I already have a land title certificate over that land, then we can look at a maximum of anything from one month. You can get it because it's just a transfer of one certificate from one party to another party. But if you are buying land, say, from the stool and you have to go through the process, you need to be sure that there's a layout covering it the person's title um, of right is genuine. If, you, if all of these are clear, then the process uh, can be very, very smooth. Uh, about 70 working days minimum uh, upwards. Okay. So, yes. So, it all depends on what you go in for and the preparatory works that must be done before you actually submit a document for processing. Sometimes you submit a document, a certain information is missing. But your contact address or your contact telephone number is inaccurate or it is somebody else's number and it takes forever to reach you unless you go back and check on the status of your document so there are quite a number of reasons why your your document may delay or why your document can be done within the shortest possible time like one month and and beyond okay and 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 this issue of land guards what what what, what exactly is that Land guards is an illegality as far as the laws of Ghana are concerned. So if anybody is walking around calling himself a land guard, that is an illegality. And for such persons, if you report to the property fraud unit at the CID headquarters of Ghana police, they will deal with any such person. There is nothing in Ghana as land guard. Actually, the laws have outlawed that practice where people walk about and call themselves land guards. So even if you're a genuine owner of land and you employ those people known as land guards to harass people on their own lands, that is an illegality. And the law will deal with them and deal with you as well. Okay. And um, James, you know, so when you are in the process, you're saying that the process sometimes takes about 70 days. Um, whilst that is happening, do you recommend that people should start developing what they are going to develop on the land? Well, it, it depends uh, on what kind of documents you have. And if within the area, there are others who have developed and they, they got the land from the same source, then you can apply for a building permit, given whichever state you have gotten to at the Lands Commission for registration. If there's no conflicting transaction, the assembly, looking at the documents that you have submitted, uh, may grant you permit to commence development. You can actually apply to build a fence wall just to secure your property. And once there's no conflicting transaction in the records of the Lands Commission, they will grant you that permit so that your land is secured before you, you ultimately get your land title certificate. That is permissible. Okay. And, and James, at the Lands Commission, is there a pool of lands that are available for people to buy? So for instance, um, can we go online or can we come to the office and say, you know, Lands Commission, do you have available lands that probably people have said to you and they want you guys to, to sell for them or government lands that people can purchase? Is there a database of where people can go to buy lands from the Lands Commission? Thank you. The Lands Commission, manages records on all recorded land transactions in Ghana. So if in a particular area there have been registered transactions,
then the Lands Commission can give you information on which land is available or information on any piece of land. The Lands Commission is of manages government lands. So lands in airport, East Lagoon, cantonments, etc. These are managed by the Lands Commission. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's, it's obvious if you know Accra very well. Um, I, I don't think that you can get that many vacant plots in this. Even if the plot is vacant, it probably belongs to somebody. So as for the Lands Commission, you are not likely to get land that is available that the Commission is, is leasing out to, to people. But that is where every land transaction is recorded. So as far as any land that you can identify anywhere that you are interested in, that is where you go to check how safe that land is or who you have to deal with if you if you intend buying that that land okay guys um james um can't stay with us long if you have any land issue please start um sending it now so he can quickly go through it but james there's one um on the screen now um okay. can you answer this one for us um this if you've reported your issue to the police but the land guards go ahead to build on the cell land who do you re report to next well you see the laws of the land are such that even if somebody has built on your land and you go to court the court can rule in your favor and if that happens the court will also authorize you to go and demolish they will give you a, a, a permit to go a demolishing order to go and have that property demolished but while somebody is building your on your land you can go to court and get a restraining order from the court so that the person is prevented from continuing the development and to decide that the case has been determined by the court and so there are there are ways of dealing with with such situations uh, unfortunately you can also not go and take land gas to go and fight the person on your land you can only report to the police and also take legal action against that person. Then the court will um, impose a restraining order until such time that the, the matter is dealt with by the court. Okay, you have another question from Doreen Dia. Is the registration stage the same as when one acquires the yellow card? The yellow card is that card that is given to you when you submit, when you lodge your documents at the Lands Commission, in this case, the Land Title Registration Division of the Lands Commission. And so that yellow card has your name and a number on it. So anytime you want to check on the status of your document that you have submitted for title certificate, it is that yellow card that you take in there, they will log it in, and then they can determine the stage at which they've got into with your document. So the yellow card itself is not a title. It is only your own um, card, which you take there to enable them to trace your document or determine uh, where the status of your own document. Okay, James, um, I think somebody missed, you know, can you clearly describe what the land guard is? I know you've, you've seen <sighs> yeah. this and missed it. Well, this, this, the land guard is somebody who is not, uh, who is not representing the owner of a land or who is not the owner of the land and uses force to prevent the rightful owner from getting onto his land or accessing his land. And so, and that, as I said, is, is an illegality. You cannot go and enter land that doesn't belong to you. And you cannot authorize somebody to go onto land that doesn't belong to that person or doesn't belong to you. Thank you. Okay. When is the right time to pay the one selling the land? When do you think? I mean, say that the property is a hundred thousand um, Ghana City. Do you pay the person, you know, uh, fifty up front, and you know, when you get the land title, you pay the rest, or is it something that you have to discuss with the person that's selling it? Exactly. You can you can negotiate on all of that. So if it's a hundred thousand Ghana cities, you agree that I'll go and check all the paperwork check your land title certificate, and once I'm sure that this property is your name and hasn't been sold to another person, then I'll pay you a certain percentage. And then when I've done my stamp duty and I have successfully transferred it into, into my name, then I'll pay you the remainder. But it all depends. This is an agreement between two parties. 
it is exclusively between two parties. There's no no lay down regulation that says that by all means you have to pay 100 percent from the beginning or you have to pay 60 percent it all depends on on, on uh, an agreement that you enter into uh, with the other party okay james somebody says paul um, peter says you know um how do you ensure that the land commission is legit we have had an incident of duplicate land title how do you ensure that such practices are avoided if we have such a situation, first of all, they will check the records to determine uh, whether both of them are genuinely recorded uh, at the last commission. Sometimes it happens because of uh, a faulty site plan on one of them. So even though we are dealing with the same piece of land, one, site, one certificate will show is plot number 13, the other will say is plot number 12. But on the ground, we are dealing with one and the same piece of land. Now, they will do the investigation and once it's determined that there's an error, they would have to go to court for the court to rule which one which one is the legitimate certificate. Unless the two parties agree that, oh, mine is wrong, or the commission can determine that somebody obtained his certificate by illegitimate means. Even there, they would have to go to court for the court to order the last committee to strike it out. So the fact that it's a conflicting transaction in the record doesn't mean that that's the end of the story for you. Once yours is a genuine transaction, there's no um, uh, false signature anywhere. There are no misrepresentations anywhere. Um, you definitely, if it goes to court, uh, you have your case prevailing. Okay, there's another question. Um, you know, what are the documents needed that one is, must hold to, you know, um, to make a transaction complete? What documents is needed? The, there is the, the document is prepared by solicitors. And that document that contains all the agreements between the two parties, that I'm selling my land to you, there's a leasehold in terms of 99 years, and this land is used for um, residential purposes, if it's a to land there's a ground rent to be paid there must also be annexed to that document the site plan a certified site plan uh, prepared by a licensed surveyor and endorsed by the regional surveyor uh, of that region where you are registering the land uh, then these will be submitted to the lands commission now if you go to the client service and access use unit of the lands commission they will actually examine the document and if any part of it is, is missing you'll be advised to go and add it, or if there's anything that is uh, uh, any misrepresentation, you be asked to go back and have it fixed before you resubmit it. So basically, it's an adventure prepared by a solicitor, uh, and then with a side plan prepared by a licensed surveyor and signed by the endorsed by the regional surveyor. That is what you you submit to the lands commission for registration. Okay. Do you foresee that Ghana may ever streamline the process of buying and selling land to make it easier and more straightforward to encourage the youth and development? Yes, indeed. Uh, the process has started. Okay. There is a pilot going on now. We call it the Ghana Enterprise Land Information System. Mm -hmm. um, it's a pilot going on in the portion of Accra where the whole process from beginning to end will be fully automated uh, so that you can actually go online and, and key in your registration number and access the status of your document. This, from the pilot, it will be rolled out throughout the, the whole country, um, well, gradually, so that at, at that point, you, you don't have to every day go to the lands commission to check whether your document uh, has been completed or not. You can go online and do that. The process has started, and I'm sure very soon there, there'll be enough publicity at every stage for, so that we know what is going on. Okay, do you need to be a Ghanaian national in order to buy land or property in Ghana? No, you don't. Um, anybody, whether Ghanaian or not, can buy land in Ghana. The only difference is that whilst a Ghanaian can have a 99-year lease or a freehold lease uh, if, if, the, if it's family land or individual, which has freehold title, a Ghanaian can have freehold. If it's two land or state land, you can only have a leasehold interest. But for foreigners, 
whatever land you are buying, the laws of Ghana, the constitution itself says that you can only have a 50-year lease at any particular time. So you, for foreigners, you can have 50-year 50 50 year leases um, regardless of where you're buying the land or what interest is being transferred to you. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, I think Peter has a follow-on um, question, but, you know, he was talking about how um, there was duplicate in land title. He goes, why does it happen in the first place and how can it be avoided rather than going to court? Because we know that going to court takes a long process in Ghana. And so, you know, you know, it's, you've mentioned that you're doing a pilot at the moment. Is that the way forward? Yes, definitely that is the way forward because, you see, the digitization uh, provides information on each parcel, and each parcel of land has a unique identifier. You know, you cannot have the same parcel of land having two different uh, grid values. So once we key in, we'll be able to determine what transaction is on this parcel of land. If there's any conflict, it will be determined right at the onset. And what I'm saying is that it's a human institution. Sometimes there are duplicate sheets that are, are produced to work. Sometimes some information is missing. But the beauty of it all is that at the end of the day, we are able to determine that, oh, and the commission itself has resolve some of these issues, the fake documents that people just go on the ground, you cannot find them, so the genuine one will go through. At the few occasions where people fight it all the way, and then if they don't understand, they will have to go to court, and the court will, will pronounce judgment on such a situation. But yes, it is true, we do have such situations, but we deal with them internally, or we, 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 we go to court and have, and have uh, this is yes okay um what is, what is where can people get more information um um from you about the land i mean is there a website that people can go on to that you know if they have questions? yes yes yeah. they can they can go online and just google the the, the lands commission has its own uh, uh, address they can get it and get all the information that they need there are telephone numbers on there that you can call during normal working hours and get and get the information yeah. Okay, fantastic. Before I leave you, so yeah. the youth who are interested in buying land and, you know, and, and getting into the property, what advice would you give the young ones who are really interested in, in, in land? Yeah, uh, what I would tell them is that they should do their proper market research. They need to research, don't rush into buying land, make sure that the land that you're dealing with is fit for purpose, it is fit for what you want to use the land for and that the person or the school or the agency or the individual or the family that you are dealing with is the rightful owner uh, before you go in and i also would want to advise the youth we need to um get into this culture of joint ventures you see you have a bit of money i have a bit of money let's put it together those who want to go into real estate those who want to go into industrialization commercialization you may not have all the money so have a joint venture get two three four people coming together putting their money together and all the ideas together so that you can you can have land to develop that is apart from those who want to just buy individual lands for their own use and all for investment purposes that's the advice that i would give them thank you so much james and somebody and thank, said that thank you too there's been several land reforms um yeah. that have been done in the past with millions of dollars spent what has been the outcome of these reforms yes uh, if you look at the reforms, see, unfortunately, people are only looking at the ability to register their land in record time. But the reforms actually has looked at so many areas. For example, the automation of the court system in Ghana, the creation of the land courts, the setting up of the, um, the new lands commission under a new app, the land use and special planning authority. All of these things were part of the reforms, except that now we are narrowing it down to the area um, where registration itself can be done in an automated uh, environment and, and definitely we'll get there. That is the stage that we've got into and just follow the news and we'll get there very soon. As I said, the pilot is already on Ghana Enterprise Land Information Systems and so that is where we get And so Thank when you. do you think that will be launched, James? When are we looking oh, at? We, before the end of this year, you begin to hear all the, the mapping that is going to go on, all the digitization that is going to go on, and which partnerships the government will go into to ensure that these things. We are looking for two things, the technical expertise to partner the, the, the 
Lands Commission and also the, the a, a sources of funds to support these projects financially. So can some so can people from the diaspora who maybe want to get involved in that, can they get involved in this? Definitely, definitely. The, the, wow. At the Lands Commission, yes, you come in there, you go okay. to the headquarters, they will give you all the information uh, from the executive secretary's office, all that you need to need, so that you can determine where, where you can fit yourself in. And now oh. is the time. Oh, fantastic. So, guys, you can actually invest as well. Um, so there's an opportunity. Thank you so much, James. I know you're Thank out you. of time. <laughs> yeah, and I yeah. really appreciate your, your efforts to join us today. Um, and I'll speak to you soon. Right, thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Oh, that was James um, Dadson um, at the Commissioner and the Lands Commission. And I hope that he has been able to, um, you know, give you the right information. For those that who are interested in investing and being part of that digitization that he's talking about, I would definitely get more information on how you can invest um, and how you can be a, a part of that. Because I think it's a very, very important that this day and age in 2020, um, everything must be online. You know, we're going through COVID-19 and we are seeing that actually, you know, it's not about going to offices, it's about doing things online. And I think that it's well about time that we um, get this completed. He's saying that it's going to be completed by the end of this year, um, but they're still looking for funds and technical support. Um, and so I think that these are some of the things that the diaspora can really, really get involved in. And so I would definitely get some more information for you guys, um, the people who are interested. I hope that he was able to answer some of your questions that you had. And, um, and please make sure that as you are watching us, you're not just, you know, indulging in this information yourself. Please share your pages now. I'm waiting for you to share your page because I can see it on my Facebook, especially if you're on Facebook. I can see whether you have shared your page or not. Please share your page with um, a loved one, with a friend, or even do a watch party and make sure that you've clicked that follow button and follow us. And also, if you are watching um, via YouTube, make sure that you subscribe to Odana Network and share your link as well on Twitter, on um, Instagram, on LinkedIn, everywhere. And let's make sure that we are all getting informed at this time. This is the time that as Ghanaians, we have to move our nation forward. And these are some of the things that we have to make sure are done and are done correctly so that we can invest in our land back home. Now, as I was saying, I had what well, I was speaking to, my beautiful Nanekia, who is an architect and also a developer herself. She's somebody that is really championing and doing so well um, in our community. And not enough light has been shining on her. And I think that this time around, we're going to put the spotlight on her and find out, you know, why she got into architect. Um, and I know that she said that her she was bribed. Her mum was just like, look, you need to do this. Um, and I want to find out why her mum told her to do that, because that's not that's not like a, Ghan a true Ghanaian mother. A true Ghanaian mother would be like doctor, lawyer, nurse and all of that kind of stuff. Architect, mm, I'm not too sure. But, you know, let's hear from Nana Kia. Nana. <laughs> All right. Nana. Yes, hello. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Can you see I me? I can hear you perfectly and I yes, can see you as well. Nana, I was yes, just saying that you, you know, our parents tell us, oh, you need to be a doctor, you know, a nurse, a lawyer. Yeah. Those are the things Ooh. that you can come out. And so why did your mother, you know, push you into going to this field? Okay, so like I said, it was blackmail. Um, because uh, uh, before, um, so I, I, I'm artistic, right? So um, from from childhood, I'd always be painting, I'd be drawing, you know. And uh, actually, like a typical Ghanaian mother, she was worried. Like, where are you going with this art stuff? <laughs> so, so um, in uh, heading towards secondary school, and of course, being the artist that I am, all I wanted to do was visual art. Um, this was a problem for her. And, a couple of teachers because you're also you know good with other with the sciences you're good with math why do you want to do art yeah so this was a, a bit of a challenge it was a family challenge and uh, my father was so supportive and uh, eventually she heard from somewhere that i could actually do architecture with art and for that reason um i, I was allowed to go and do um visual arts but that meant that i didn't have a choice <laughs> you are going to do architecture with it um eventually of course it uh, so i'm one of those that started architecture having no clue about architecture wow 
Wow. Like literally in the classroom and I've never seen an architect before. Wow. Let alone know what they do. So wow. it's um and, and and for me it's um like as an encouragement to people who find themselves in spaces like that. In my case, um my mother blackmailed me but it turned out to be really what I was meant to do because I cannot imagine doing anything else. So wow. <laughs> So, you know, in the classroom, were there other women in the classroom or were you finding that, you know, you were the only female in the classroom? No, so we did have some women. Of course, um, for every year group, the women are so much less than the, the men. You know, you have so many guys and we were, we started at the hundred and... What would you say the ratio was? I would say um, like one to five. Okay. One to five. That's like, that's high. And we were supposed to be those with a lot more women. Like we, you know, we had a lot more women in our class, but I would say something like one to five. Eventually though, um, not a lot of women continue to practice because the space actually um, becomes difficult for, for women to go full at it. So it takes um, quite eventually very few very few of us actually continue in the you know core practice most women branch out into other things so that's how it is for, for us women. and did you learn everything in ghana or did you have to go outside i mean where where, where was your so, yes yeah, so this is one of the things also um i so all my all my training is in ghana mm -hmm. i get like you, you know and i'm sure that's where you're coming from because you see my work and you see um what we're doing and it's like and we get that a lot are you guys all trained here uh, did you yeah. train in ghana did you i i'm proud to say yes i'm a hundred percent trained in ghana so um i'm one of those people i'm one of those people that uh i did have opportunities to go outside most of my siblings trained outside um but i just had this strong um, feeling that there had to be those people too who would, you know, stand up uh, toe to toe, shoulder to sh shoulder with the rest of the world who were training Ghana. Because when you go for, you find that when you go, um, when you look up, people you look up to most of the times have had opportunities to have something additional from outside. And then for those who don't have that opportunity, it's almost like, can we ever make it if we don't go outside? Mm. Mm. Please, um, you can you can very much make it and make it at the top of your profession. Fantastic. If Even if you went through it um, in Ghana. And for me, there's never been any regret there. Is this is this one of your buildings? Is this one of your architects? Yes, one of my recent ones. <laughs> yes, so this is one of her designs. Um, and yes. is this another one? Yes, this is in Cantonment, yeah. This is in Cantonment. Um, and so, I mean, where do you get your, your the, you know, the ideas from? Okay, so um, <laughs> let's say, and this comes back to whether you're outside or you're here. I think there's something very special for our generation. Mm. Um, we are here talking, you are all the way in UK. I'm here in Ghana. I don't know where other people are, but all of us, all of us have access to the same information. Mm. We literally have the world in our palms. Like... You don't you you don't have to stop yourself because you're not um, you're not getting the chance to physically go to you know a certain place to be able to do. Um, I I tell students because I'm also engaged in uh, the architecture schools. Um, sometimes I go in to give lectures and so I tell them all the time. There are things that you don't need to physically be there. Now you can sit on YouTube and really go anywhere you want to go. They have videos. You walk so you can inspire yourself. So for me. Um, yes, I, I do love traveling. I travel a lot. Um, but beyond that, um, you know, I have all this that I, I bring together because I also know where I'm going. I know what I'm, I'm, I'm looking out for. So basically, that's it. My inspiration is from all over the place. <laughs> like, um, I, architecture is so dynamic, you know. Um, I keep saying, I cannot, you cannot bring me a land and I'll just put the same thing out put for the other person on there because your idea your size is different your needs are different you mm -hmm. know and all and give you a house an office a commercial project whatever it is that is specific to you i've done my job mm -hmm. you know i've done my job how, no, no, how do you, so do you have like a consultation process where the person can also give 
um, you some ideas that, you know, I have a vision and I think I want it to look like this, you know, um, this is something that I want the class to be like that. Do you, do you get a lot of yeah, that yeah. from your clients or do you kind of say, um, no, this, do you kind of give them what you think rather than what they, they want? No, so it's a, it's a working process. Um, there are some things that are, are fixed. So your land is fixed. Um, how we will use the land, it's really, you know, the architect's uh, vision and creativity. But at the end of the day, um, yes, you will come into, I call it the wish list. Mm. Um, I advise people in selecting an architect. Unfortunately, we, we find ourselves in spaces where People select, you know, go around asking, how much will you charge me to do this? How much will you charge me to do that? And <laughs> that becomes the reason for an architect. Um, at the end of the day, you know, it's creativity and it's design. Everybody has their style. So before you will go to an architect, research on them. Look at what they are doing. We are in a field where we actually are not permitted to advertise. Mm. We, our work comes from referrals. So go around, look at what they're doing. If, if you can, visit one of their projects, feel it. Okay, this is something that's looking like um, a direction I want. Because if you came to me and insisted on an architectural style that I don't align with for you know strong philosophical reasons, mm -hmm. I'm happy to direct you to an architect who works in that direction. No problem at all. So you need to understand. And then, especially for those going for homes, Homes are so personal, you know? So you will want to also connect with the architect personally. Mm. If you get, you, if you, 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 you like the vibe, if they are catching on to, you know, what your vision is, because most of the times, and I tell this to my, my, my trainees, if a client comes to you and yeah, they come with their wish list, I want a glass this way, I want that this way. Mm. And in the end, you give them what they could have done for themselves, then they didn't need to pay you. True. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. So, so in the end, and this is this is literally 99% of the time when you've done a project, your client walks in and say, wow, I could have never imagined it this way. But it's exactly what I wanted. I just didn't know how to, you know, get there. And that's what I'm trained to do. The architect is trained to capture what you, you think you want and actually make it the way you want it, not the way you thought it was going to be. So that's that's really what we are, we are here for. And that's the magic of it. And I always love it um, when we get that feedback from our clients. So, and, and Nana, you know, looking at what you've um, done so far, um, what has been some of your most memorable or favorite designs that you've done? You've like... Ugh. Or when people see it, they always call you to say, Nana, this one, dear. It's, it's, it's a oh, Yeah, I, so, um, you know, almost, and this is like, I kid you not, almost every time um, we have this kind of reaction because we put a lot into generating what we do. Um, so people get surprised how much work goes into generating what we do. Um, if you have, you, it, those who know us, I mean, sometimes you come and find people working in the in the middle of the night because we just have to hit yeah. that mark. Um, I'll tell you a story. Once um, we were, uh, I was being interviewed, and uh, the, the 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 interviewer asked, "Oh, so um, how is it? What's the feedback from clients like?" And really, literally, one of my clients, whose house we had just completed, had come down to pick up drawing or something like this. And had decided to walk into my office to say hello. He entered and he's like, Nana, I could never have, I love my house Aww. so much. Like he, when he started, he didn't think he could make much out of this profile neighborhood where um, people buy in acres and build like, you know, the mansions of the mansions. And he sits in his one plot land and people with acres come around and try to like, look through or you know who did this house or, mm. because that's how much we did this for him and he and his family love and enjoy it mm. and at the end that's our satisfaction that you you, this, you spend your money on it and that's what people forget mm. you're going to spend a lot of money to build a house whether you like it or not yeah so it's almost like and i use this i use this description for for especially for the ladies when you are buying an expensive kente or lease you are cautious of where you take it to be because to be you know sown because if it goes wrong that's a lot of money going down the drain yeah people forget 
So sure. instead of going around looking for, oh, who will charge the least, or I can get some draftsman to draw something, you know, I'm just doing a plan. No, you are in, that's your investment you are putting there. Mm. In fact, um, maybe when we go around and come back, I, I had, uh, uh, I gave a, a talk in my church about, you know, basically young people going into real estate, either building or buying, and ba basically like a guideline for how you go from, you know, point A to point B. Mm. Um, I, if we'll come back to me, but if we do, I'd like to share some of the insights from there. No, definitely. And and have you gotten, you know, oh, that, I thought you was a man or like, you know, have you, did you, did you ever get oh, that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, like our favorite, eh? <laughs> because, uh, um, because also we do have an unexpected, um, unexpected, you know, large amount number of ladies in our office and um, people don't expect that so and we are how not many, how, many ladies, how many ladies do you employ how many ladies do you employ um so we used to be we used to be well in total we're about 52 staff and and of, of the uh, the 22 architects we had maybe 12 or okay. you know 12 women okay, and wow. so people don't usually expect and and well management also myself my partner the most of the um, higher <laughs> executive, uh, executive yes so exactly. it does we do get um very much uh that reaction especially when these are people who have seen our works or they've come from a referral from a major project like you know this is a big project and then they come in it's us lovely ladies <laughs> yes that's behind it Yes, and it's even better um, when our engineers, because um, one of our engineers is here, the other one couldn't join us. Yeah. But our engineers are also women, and it's like, fantastic. it's just what, you know. Fantastic, fantastic. And, and um, I mean, I've had the privilege of seeing some exclusive designs which hasn't been released yet. I've seen the Greenwich Meridian, um, the, the design, yeah. plan, and I'm just, I can't yeah. wait for people to see it because it is incredible. I mean, what you guys have done and yeah. you know, when it comes to life, it's just gonna blow people's minds away. And yeah. I'm just so encouraged that, you know, we have leaders who are women in this field that are doing amazing things. And for us as, you know, young women that want to go into that field, if even there's a, there's a young person that wants to go to, into architect, architecture, what would you say to them? Okay, so um, architecture, like any creative field, is a passion. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, it's this is a six year course in the university. Wow! After which, a doctor. Um, wow. you doctor have to do a mini course. I know. Wow. I know. <laughs> wow! So um, yes, yes, it's a six year um, course in the university. That's two times secondary school, oh. and. Uh, after that, you have to do two years apprenticeship and then be qualified to write your licensing exam, which is another, you know, hurdle most of us. Um, I mean, people wait years to get to that, but that's where you actually get licensed and you have like a stamp. I mean, at this point, you're like, you just go around like I'm the king of the world because now you have the stamp. But yeah, that's, that's an eight-year journey. And typically, before you can start a firm, you should have worked for 10 years. What? So, yeah. So, yes. So, it's, it's, um, I mean, things are where I'm on the Council of the Ghana Institute of Architects. Um, so I'm involved now in, you know, architecture and how we, you know, we're changing things a bit to make it bring it into today a little bit. So, it may not take 10 years and things like that, but it is a regulated industry that requires a lot of, of, um, and that's why, for example, we don't advertise because they also do, we don't want a situation where um, people are screaming in the back, you know, in the back, I do the best designs, I do the best designs. At the end of the day, if you don't and a building comes down, that's serious um, trouble for everybody, you know, if a mm. building breaks, it's, it's an issue. And that's why I would say, for example, I would, for every work we do, we'll have our structural engineers, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, we have, we put the full professional team together because the risk involved and in our integrity on the line if a building doesn't work is something else altogether. So I will say you have to have the passion to hold you through this period. Okay. 
Okay. So those are exactly, and that's how you have many people, you know, dropping at the side, finding other ways because it can be daunting. But if you have the passion, like mm -hmm. Confucius said, do what you love and you never work a day in your life. Yeah, it's true. So Ian has a question for you. He says, Denta, please mm -hmm. let her give us the finance involved in getting a professional advice or plans mm -hmm. from people like her. Okay. So um, very soon there's going to be, you know, publications about things like this because we realize it's a big problem people don't understand what goes into the pricing for our services um and so people end up using the pricing as a a, a decision maker on how to get their designs and usually they end up regretting you know because it is not what they expected it's either too expensive to build so let's say our work is actually related it is um our charges are related to the value of the project we are doing so if you are doing a three bedroom house and it's going to cost um a hundred thousand cities to build our yeah. fees for the architects for the engineers for everybody involved in making sure that that building is efficient and working well is a percentage. Um, the standard right now for design stage is about eight percent, and then we supervise the construction. So Ooh. after we yes, after we've designed for you, um, we will come to your site. We will have site meetings. We will we will supervise the construction because yes. Um, we supervise the construction, and uh, sometimes even after it's finished, because for commercial projects, they are, they are, you know, different requirements as well. But yeah, so that's how long we stay with you on your. It's not just get a picture and go, or get a drawing and go. Mm. Um, we have yes, we we also have um, professional indemnities, things like that. You know, whole lot of insurance issues, so that we are we are we are responsible professionally for your house until it's completely done and you can go away comfortably. Um, so yes, our fee is a percentage of the construction cost. Now what happens is if you are working with professionals, we are trained to design efficiently. So for a lot of, uh, you think, oh, I'm just doing a three bedroom house. This guy will charge me, you know, 2000 CDs and I'll have my three bedroom house. The guy is not trained to design efficiently. So ends up designing 450 square meters of building for you. You don't know yet. Mm. You start realizing, wait a minute, my money is not enough. I can't do this. I can't do that. So you will see that a lot of people end up with uncompleted structures because their money is finished. Oh, they couldn't wow. finish the house. And then you just, you know, you move into it in the end because that's what you can afford. But that's also defacing the urban context because people are not working with professionals in such a way that you can start and finish. The value, what you're paying us is to ensure that what we are giving you, you can start and finish. Yeah. Um, for the for those listening, and we're talking about youth getting into real estate, please, for heaven's sake, your first house is not the end of your life. Your first house does not have to be the mansion like your father's house. You have to start thinking efficiently. And when we come back to me, if we do, there's yeah. a whole, you know, whole space in there about urban context and where people should even live, especially the youth. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Where people should live. Mm. The, the land man broached on something. I almost wondered if he was at my presentation at the church because <laughs> I'm encouraging people, I'm encouraging people as much as possible. Don't go out there unless you have all the money. Come together as five people, six people, mm. corporate development. If you cannot buy, come together as five. You don't need a five-bedroom house with garage and so and so, all these things from the start. You need a good location. Because mm. mind you, when you are you are buying, when you are building or buy where you're going to stay, it's more than just a land. In fact, um, I'll just slip quickly to just go through this. It's more than just that. When you buy a parcel of land, you're buying neighbors. You're yeah. buying proximity to work and school. You're buying car maintenance costs. You're buying fuel efficiency. You're buying security. You're buying access to quality lifestyle and services. You're mm. buying punctuality. I've been there. You're buying access to business opportunities. You're buying investment prospects. You are not just buying a land or just buying a house. You're buying all these things. So even in deciding where to build your house or where to buy a house, if the location is where it will meet all these things, 
please come together with a couple of friends, a couple of people who are also ready. Architects are trained to give you a mansion on a small piece of land. Don't worry at all. And then find professionals. We will do it for you. This is what I'm advising people now. Come together in groups and build in good locations. Okay, so was that, was that the presentation that you did? Is there any other advice that you would, because uh, I, I, I'm really curious in finding out, you know, the, the things that you discussed at your presentation that would be good for our audience? <clears throat> okay, so um, um, one of the things, uh, well, one of, may, let me go through a step by step. I have yes. the step one, step two, let me just run through quickly. Um, so at the first step of uh, building your home, you need to, define what it is you're going to do so I, I say you have a wish list it's basically like you were saying you know you come and say i want my house like this it's like your dream wish list everything you want to imagine and what happens is your architects would normally pick all this information and rationalize it in a way that is efficient in a way that is um meets a budget in a way that is uh, works with your site all kinds of things and bring it back to you and say based on this information this is you know, the, the best situation for you. So have a wish list. Identify your budget, it's important. Um, there are so many costs that go into it. And then the next um, thing is to have a timeline. It's important. You need to start and finish. You have to have an intention to finish at a certain point. Then the next thing, the step two, which is finding um, your sites, is like everywhere else, location, location, location. I already went through the list of when you buy a land, what you're actually buying beyond the land itself. Um, the other thing was definitely buying groups. Um, with advancements in technology and engineering, people are going to need less and less space in order to live efficiently and sustainably. Guys, we are not our parents. Most of us, <laughs> the most kids we have is four. Don't tell you and I are guilty. <laughs> the most kids we have are four. Um, our parents were saddled with uh, uh, nieces, nephews, cousins, all kinds of people. And, you know, to show where you've reached, these people, our parents had to build these kind of humongous structures, which in the end become, you know, ghost towns when all the children leave. You don't want to start life that way. You want to start something and finish and be, be efficient. So I advise associations, groups, Corporate organizations come together and procure land together and build in, you know, portable uh, sizes, I, I say, if portable and efficient size. The next thing is to find a team. And in this team, you're talking about your art, architect, quantity surveyor, structural engineer, mechanical engineer, electrical engineer, plumbing engineers, you know, and then you come to surveyors and contractors. The thing is, you don't need to go out looking for all these people. Typically, the architect is leading the team. So if you find an architect you're comfortable with, they should usually bring on board the rest of these, these people. Um, your search for the perfect team starts with finding your perfect architect. Like I said, you, you, you architects don't um, advertise. Find them via referrals, social media, internet, search, uh, or direct contact with Ghana East of Architects. We have an association where if you go and find you know, someone there, you're sure you're getting professional services. Then assess their portfolios. Identify and shortlist a couple of them who you like the way their design is. This looks like something you know, I'm envisioning for myself. Shortlist a couple of them. And then number three, conduct a chemistry test. I call it a chemistry test. Engage each one personally. Possibly request a visit to some of their sites. No problem. You are, you are satisfying yourself that I'm comfortable to work with this person. Mind you, they are also satisfying themselves that they are comfortable to work with you. It's a two-way affair. And then you narrow down to um, two or three who connect with you on the chemistry level. And uh, then and only then may you start talking about prices so that you know that this category of people that I found are going to give me what I'm looking for. And then you can start talking about how much will you charge me to do so and so. And then you select by the way, it's illegal to demand a design idea from more than one architect for the same project as a means of deciding who you are going to choose without compensating each of them for the service of it. This is actually something that's going to also be coming out um, because this is um, ongoing, an ongoing issue. And then, of course, the rest is quite technical. Once the work is done, there's going to be a whole lot of processes for getting your permit. But if you are with professionals, you shouldn't have a problem. 
it's when you are not with professionals that you have a problem at this stage. But all the way to, and this one shocked me when I gave the, the, um, I, the talk at the church, but you actually need a certificate of um, occup occupation. When you finish your building, you need to get certified to, to, to actually use it. That shocked a lot of people. Um, but yes, that's, that is the case. You need a certificate of occupation to um, ensure that uh, this building is, is actually usable. Uh, I think the rest are quite technical. I can leave it here, but this is basically a gist of, of where you go and how you feel about it. Fantastic. I think you've gotten, uh, there was a question that Chrissy had put up. Uh, have, somebody's asking this question. Akida, have you heard of partnership architecture? Have you heard of that? I'm not sure. No, I'm not sure I've heard of this Earthship architecture, but from the name, I can deduce where or what, um, you know, direction it is. Is mm -hmm. What will you advise, buying an apartment or buying a house? Deborah, it depends on you. Um, I am a mother of four. I have a family of six with a nanny. I live in an apartment very comfortably and happily. It just means that when I have this program, I have to suck the kids. But... Uh, <laughs> I live in an apartment because the location of this apartment satisfies the things I listed. Yeah. This is in Abilimpi. It means that going to work is not a problem. Um, access to all kinds of things is not a problem. My car won't suffer because I'm using a bad road all the time. Um, the children can get to school on time. They don't need to wake up at ungodly hours. Um, basically, so it's, it's up to you, your lifestyle and what your expectations are. Um, if you're in town as well and you can afford a house, that's also good. Um, but whatever the case, I keep saying, going back to location, location, location. Um, having good neighbors, you know, um, in my dad's house, they have a church just started behind the house and it's a big problem because, you know, it's one of those. So if you're, for example, we have estate developers here. If you're buying an estate, um, you're sure of the environment also, you know, for your own um, betterment. Do you only work in Ghana or do you have projects in other African countries? We have um, ventured into, into other African countries. Um, a couple of them are yet to materialize in Nigeria. Um, we started something in Sierra Leone just before Ebola hit and we ran away. Oh, wow. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, there's a discussion in Kenya as well. Okay. All right, fantastic. Yeah. So I'm going to move on to our other ladies who are eagerly waiting behind the scene. And I think I'm going to oh, introduce, I'm going to introduce Ya. Um, Ya, because, you know, she's been in the electrical, she's been an electrical engineer for over 15 years. And for me, it's mind blowing because honestly, I, when, when I think about these, you know, these roles, I just think about the man. And so I want to find out from her how she also got into the industry and why electrical engineering. So guys, welcome. Yeah. Hi, yeah. Okay. So hi, Denta. Hi. I had a good mic. Yeah. Hi, Nanek. Yeah. <laughs> how well, are we? I want to, I want to, you know, I want to find out from you, like, how and why, basically. <laughs> you know, it's funny, but when Anekia was speaking, I was just laughing in my head because I've also, I am an accidental engineer. What? Um, accidental in the sense that everyone who knew me from childhood thought I'd end up doing probably politics or international relations or something in that direction. Mm. But I've always had a strong affinity to mathematics and, and physics. Okay. And I've okay. loved the sciences. I've also loved international relations. And my idea was that I was going to go into work with probably the World Bank, go into policy advisory and things that would pretty much change the world. Um, when I started doing engineering, I realized that there's a human aspect to engineering that we always forget. When we think of engineers, we think of the technical aspects and we don't realize that they're also solving problems. Um, so when I figured that I was such a, strong math and physics person and I still wanted to do this my idea when I entered university my idea was to do a dual degree and so do a dual degree where I'd be an engineer and an international relations um, major wow. at the same time 
So it was a reason why I selected the university I did. Um, unfortunately, when I got in, they realized um, my intentions were not in the normal program. And the only way you can actually do engineering is if you do not do international relations and you branch off and do the main sciences. So I ended up doing my first degree in mathematics and my engineering degree at Columbia University. So that's how I entered engineering. I was trying to do the two simultaneously and then go into a field where I'd be changing the world. But I also had the opportunity to have a father who's a mechanical engineer. And when I was growing up, my dad was working in Nigeria. So as a, as a kid, he was in Nigeria. And whenever he came back, he thought he had to make up for lost time. So he would, when he's going for a trek, he would carry me along and I would go with him to all his project sites. Most of them, you know, in very far away towns in Ghana. And I saw what he did, I was really young, but I saw exactly what he was doing and um, consultancy became something that I was curious about. So when I entered engineering school, um, as an electrical engineer, there's several aspects of electrical and electronics that you can branch into. But I had always thought that because I knew what consultancy was, I wanted to branch into the building aspect of engineering. So my focus was to do that. Luckily for me, when I graduated from school, my first job that I landed was with a consultancy in New York. So that's pretty much how my career started. And um, I had a, my first project was a, a 61 story hotel in Las Vegas, which was fantastic because I was right out of college. Wow. And um, this was the first job that I had to handle with a team of five. Funny enough, all five of us were women as well. Wow. And it was a wonderful experience. I had to learn how to read the code because most buildings, well, buildings everywhere have to follow a certain standard and specifications. And you need to know the town and um, city codes that you are applying for the buildings. And I thought to myself, if I'm going to live here and learn the codes of New York and learn the codes of Las Vegas, when I'm ready to move to Ghana, I'm going to start all over to learn the codes of Ghana. Okay. So the earlier I move, the better. Mm. Um, they were very disappointed when I spoke with my bosses, but I, I made that bold move after a very short period with um, my old firm, WSB. Mm -hmm. um, they actually happened to me be my partners right now. Yeah. Um, so I left and then moved back to Ghana. And, you know, how was the transition from, you know, you know, the work ethics abroad, okay? Mm -hmm. You know that everything is kind of scripted in a way. Um, mm -hmm. How was it when you came to Ghana and starting afresh and being in this field that's so manly um, mm -hmm. and getting your foot into the door? Okay. So, Danta, again, I was an accidental engineer and I became an accidental um, CEO. Wow. I moved back actually to work with my father's company. Um, when I, I was moving, the idea was that he was a majority partner in a firm and he was the, the, the deal he struck with me that made me move to Ghana was that whatever shareholding he had in the firm, 30% of his shares were going to be informally transferred to me. But not immediately. I had to work and rise up the ranks. And um, at a certain point, he was going to then start giving me these shares. But in the meantime, I started off, I moved to Ghana with an agreement for 800 CDs a month. And that's what brought me to Ghana. And I was making so much money in New York, to be honest with you. <laughs> but it was because I knew the opportunity and the growth pattern if I had moved. And I so I never moved here with the idea that I had moved in the position of a, you know, a director of a company. I really moved in as an employee. Mm. Unfortunately, when I moved to Ghana, a few years down the line, his company um, had some issues, went into some issues and um, it went defunct. And I was stuck with the, with the decision to then set up a new firm and roll his stuff onto that company. So I had the opportunity to then become, and I and he's still the major consultant for me. So I had the opportunity to then start a company, bring in some of the people from his old firm and then start new people. I'll be honest with you, the transition for me, um, the challenge was to do with staffing and also to do with a human resource development. Because in consultancy, and I work with Nanekui a lot, in consultancy, we use our brain. Um, the individual who's working needs to apply their knowledge and their technical ability. And the way we've learned some, not I mean, I, and I'm not generalizing, but the way some people have been trained 
um, to apply themselves requires a bit of push. So you'd realize that you're putting in so much effort to develop the human resource capability of your firm, and um, it takes a lot more effort. So the biggest, for me, the biggest transition was to do with coming here, settling in, and then keeping the staff strength as strong as it had to be. It's still a challenge. It hasn't been a very easy journey for me. And and how do you pick your 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 jobs that you do? I mean, you know, I know that you, you work with the likes of Nanequia, but how do you pick, you know, this is something that I want to get involved in? Okay. So let me just quickly say, for most people, people ask, you know, for electrical engineers, what are you doing in buildings? Mm. So when it comes to buildings, we're a very crucial part of the building process in the sense that we form the spine of the building. When you think of putting up a building, you're looking at the beauty, the aesthetics and all that. But there's an aspect of the building that makes it functional. And the functionality of the building depends on the engineer. So the electrical engineer, the civil engineer, structural engineer, and the mechanical engineer ensure that the functionality of the building is intact. Mm -hmm. Now, the process, it depends on the type of project. So we do both commercial, we do residential, and we do industrial buildings. Mm -hmm. Some of our buildings requires, or some of our projects requires the input of architects. So that's to do mostly with buildings. Um, we also do things like master planning where we are pretty much doing engineering only and we're not really working with um, architects. But in doing work that we work with architects, it's either you, uh, mostly the architect becomes a project lead and they bring on the projects and forms the consortium. So the consortium is made up of the same people I've listed, including a quantity surveyor. So um, that's one way of selecting your projects. The other way is to ensure that you always have um, a link to, so I work with contractors directly as well. So okay. in design and build, we have teams where we work directly with contractors who have been approached to do certain types of jobs. So electrification, um, you'd have uh, meant projects where we have to deal with certain projects, you know, and we work directly with contractors. We work directly with clients as well. And 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 and, and yeah, do you have to be involved in the design process? So do you have to work with somebody like Nanekia as part? Oh, yes. Of okay. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So uh, it and I always say that. Most architects realize that it's important for us to start from scratch with them. Okay. The reason is that if they're putting up a building, and let me give you an example, a commercial building. A commercial building would require a plant room, a place where we're going to keep the panel boards for the electrical work. We're going to see where we're going to get you back. Bear with me, guys. As you know, internet um, is an issue when you are trying to do some of these things. But I hope that, you know, you're interested in what everybody is saying. Please, if you haven't already shared, um, you know, your Facebook page, please share it so that somebody else can learn what we are talking about today. And I think it's also very important for you to like and also, um, you know, subscribe to the channel. Um, there's some very important uh, messages um, being okay. spoken. Okay, we're back. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry. I think I had to switch um, my in internet connectivity. So I was saying that, um, I don't know where you lost me. Um, start from the top, because it was it's a start breaking up. Okay, so, okay, all right. So I was saying that, um, yes, it's important that we work with architects from scratch. The reason is um, if, if we had to do a commercial building, a very big school, and let's say, or I mean, a very big office or an, an, an educational building, a school, the person who's designing the school knows that they would need a place to keep their power plant. They'd need a place to keep their UPS room, where the IT rooms would be, all the things that goes in there. They would also need to ensure that they've given us enough space in the ceilings to run our cables, our cable trays, all the pipe work that goes within the ceiling. Mm -hmm. So if the architect goes ahead and designs and designs the, the space in such a way that the ceiling doesn't have any false space, um, then they bring in the engineer. Then we come in and say, oh, oh, no, 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 we need space. Do this, create that. It becomes cumbersome. So from the beginning, Oh, 
Yeah, we are losing you again. Yeah, we are losing Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I've just lost Yeah, but uh, hopefully she will come back on so that we can continue um, the conversation. But I'm going to invite some of our developers onto um, the show now. And I think I'm going to invite Kieran. Um, Kieran, I know that she used to be in Dubai. Um, I think it's Dubai. I'll, I'll get her to correct me if I'm wrong. And she, you know, she she moved to Ghana some years back and started and started the Greens. Um, when I saw some of her buildings that are based in Tema, um, I was blown away. Um, very simple houses, um, very affordable. Um, and I want to talk to her about her journey and why she went into real estate. Hi, Kieran. Hi, Denta. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for all you do for all of us, putting the spotlight on all of us, all women. Really, uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, too. So, um, you know, before I go back to Ya, yeah, I just want to, you know, talk to you about, you know, so obviously you have the architecture, design, and then you have, you know, the engineers and the people that work on um on the project you know what made you go into real estate in the first place and why ghana so from Dubai, okay. you know so so first of all i think that every woman's journey today on your panel seems to be accidental because mine also happens oh to be God. accidental <laughs> yeah yeah oh, wow. so so um i moved to ghana in 2014 uh from dubai like you rightly said and uh, I first moved with a company that is based there called Mulk Holdings. Uh, they are a multi-billion dollar conglomerate. They're into construction, manufacturing, uh, medical, uh, different uh, uh, industries. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, we moved to Dubai, to Ghana, sorry, and opened a facade company, uh, which meant that we were in the construction industry, but doing all uh, external uh, glazing, curtain wall, cladding for buildings. So I was in the construction industry, beautifying, let's say, buildings. Okay. Um, in 2017, I came across a distress sale, a gentleman who had some man who needed to leave Ghana and needed cash. So I went to see the land and I didn't know what I was going to do with it, but I just said, you know what, let me just buy this. And instead of having the money in the bank, let me just buy this and then let's see what happens. So I bought the land without even thinking I'm going to go into development or I'm going to build. I, did, I had no idea, but I thought it was a good deal. It was a distress sale and then just bought it. Met with a developer from Tema who... Okay actually said to me, you know what, Kieran, uh, worse comes to worse, you can resell the land or you can just divide it and have it as service plot or you can develop it. And I said, okay. So then we called the, um, an architect and he did the 3D renderings for our development that you're showing now. And I said, you know what, I really, really, it inspired me because it goes from Property development goes from design, uh, architecture, uh, building, uh, law, uh, finance, um, so many different um, scopes that it really made me personally feel very, very fulfilled and creative. So it's like you using both sides of your brain. And I just, I just love what I do. Mm. Mm, mm. And you so, know, Kieran. Yes. Okay. The, in, the, in, the internet is a bit shaky, but we will we will take it like that. Otherwise, I think I'm going to lose all my my guests today um, due to internet. Um, but so you, you know, so you started building, um, and you know, you went to it into it accidentally. Um, why did you decide to do affordable houses? Because there's, you know, there's high ranges of different prices in Ghana when you look at the property industry. What made you go for more affordable? And what, what are your prices of your homes? 
So our prices are from $76,000. I know we're not supposed to quote in dollars, but just to make it easier for everyone, I'm saying $76,000 to $125,000. Okay. They are um, uh, terraced houses and uh, semi-detached and detached houses, two and three bedrooms and four bedrooms, actually. Okay. And going, I just think... Um, we we turn to a, to a niche of clientele that is like our young professionals, which are you know well young professionals, which you're still saying to the mortgage in our uh, for our uh, property, you need to still be making anywhere your household of about ten thousand Ghana CDs, which is still quite a lot. Mm. So it's not it's it's affordable. But we're like targeting, like I say, our young professionals, um, gated community, because we still think that, you know, today uh, in a couple, both the man and the woman are now most probably both working. So yeah. if you want to leave your children maybe in a secure gated community, uh, if you want to rent it out, there is more demand also. So we're not using so much space. So then also, you know, you can also have prices that are not so elevated. Mm. The land, because it was well purchased also, it's not like land also defines the price of the property. So if we bought in airport or in prime location, then the price would be different. Different, yeah. So, yeah. And, and how, how are sales going? How, how are you finding the industry so far? So what is really curious, Denta, which I've, I'm quite surprised, is that since the lockdown, since COVID, people are really taking that leap to now start purchasing, which is really extraordinary. Wow. I'm so surprised. Yeah. yeah. I think people have realized also that, you know, if they've put that decision on hold, it's like they are now saying, you know, now's the time because it's it showed so much uncertainty that maybe they are now making these decisions now that maybe they've just maybe they've had more time. Mm. But we thank God our sales since the lockdown have been really phenomenal. Wow! Wow! Yeah. So how, how many how all from the diaspora? All from the diaspora. All from the diaspora are coming yeah. to buy home. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And, you know, you mentioned about yeah. the prices. So if somebody's buying a two-bedroom um, apartment, you know, what would they be looking at? Can you tell me the prices of one-bedroom, two-bedroom, three-bedroom? So a two-bedroom terraced house, which is about 85 square meters, they're mm -hmm. going for $76,000. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. normally you have to have 20%. If you're going for a mortgage, you would have to have uh, saved up 20% of your down payment right and then you can apply uh, for a mortgage we've got the uh, Ghana home loans we've got Republic Bank we've got Stambic Bank we've got different banks that will then do the assessment to see if you qualify for a mortgage okay yeah so that's uh, that's are, so are you seeing more people buying cash per purchases or mortgage both both okay both. Both. Okay. 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 So um, you would say that COVID-19 has been good then? <laughs> it has. I shouldn't say it out too loud, but it has. Okay. So we are grateful. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. We're going to come back to you with some of the questions that people are asking. But now I'm going to bring my very own Genevieve. I've had the opportunity of working with Imperial Homes for many years now. They have supported Guba, my organization. They have, you know, they have supported myself. Um, and, you know, even my team members will testi testify that, you know, they've lived in the home and they absolutely loved it. Um, and, you know, I have Genevieve, who's one of the directors who I work very closely with. Um, and she's a boss chick, she's a boss lady. Um, and I'll say that, you know, I'm so happy that she's managed to join um, us today. And please welcome Genevieve from Imperial Homes. Hello. Hi, Jen. Hello, Denta. How are you? How are you? I'm, I'm fine. Thank you, sis. Good to have you. It's a pleasure. Obviously, Jen, 
um, I hope you're not gonna tell me just like Nanekia, just like yeah, that you accidentally got into. It's the same. <laughs> it's the same. Oh my goodness! <laughs> I actually got to know. It looks like all the women ended up in real estate just by kind of an accident. What? So what happened? What was your what what happened to you? What was your scenario? Well, as a girl growing up, going to school, getting education and all that, I just wanted to do something that is comfortable, maybe work in the bank or maybe become a lawyer and all that. Then oh my my daddy was into construction, he was a civil engineer, and my brothers are into as well. So I was just the one trying to divert to somewhere else. Then I was working in the bank and okay. Francis called me. I, was, I ended up in Billet. Oh, and really? Nikia. Yeah, and in Nikia as well. So that's how I ended up there. Wow. And how, how is the real estate industry? When we talk about the real estate industry in, in Ghana, I mean, you guys have been there now, is it 11, 11 years now um, mm -hmm. of Imperial Homes? You know, how has the journey been and how has it been, you know, as one of the female directors in the organization? It's, it's been fun and a little bit challenging, but I'm sure when you are firm and you know what you're about and you know the product you're selling, it just becomes easy for you. There have, there have been a few challenges, but it's easy to overcome as a woman if you really know what you're about. So when somebody is looking to buy a property, what should they be looking out for? I mean, I know you have your own um, Imperial home. So when somebody's buying an Imperial home, what should they be looking out for? Well, Imperial homes, we sell quality and space. You know, um, I heard um, the Greens saying, um, I think a three bedrooms about 85 square meters. That's kind of my one bedroom. In imperial homes so basically we do sell space in the uh, what do you call it this area you know in cantonment and in airport okay. so you know it's quite expensive to get a land in cantonment and in airport so when i'm doing something for them on that land i need to give them space and good quality for their money so when you're you're looking to buy from imperial homes you should look out for that the space the quality the finishing and the neighborhood that's that's what we sell we sell luxury that's what we, we sell, sell luxury and would you say that most again is most of your um buyers from the diaspora are you getting anything locally bought well we have um let's say about 70 80 percent from ghana and the rest from diaspora yeah. okay so 70 percent. wow and you know typically um what range uh, uh pricing wise there's there's imperial homes cost <laughs> i'm not bragging I know, but i know it ranges so you can give us a range yeah, yeah. okay just bear within one fifty thousand dollars and about 3.8 million dollars okay and there's a high tier obviously there's a high tier of you know i know you have um, penthouses that you do i mean some of the buildings that i showed that you know the architect um nana ekia did is it is imperial homes i'll just you know mm -hmm. reload them but these are typically so something like this what is it called and where is it where would it where is it situated in in, in, in ghana this is in cantonment okay it's a full house five bedrooms with um, about four garages and all that you know the luxury dream one okay. we should be talking about three million dollars for this development Okay, and then something like this that you've done as well. Yes, in Cantonment on the um, Kakramandu Street. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is um, three and four bedrooms. I think we have about one bedroom penthouse and a two bedroom up there. Yeah. Okay, and, and Bentley Oak. Bentley Oak, and and the price wise, we sold this um, for um, two fifty thousand to about five fifty. Okay, okay. So, Nana, I mean, what does it take? I mean, I do, I have got somebody from um, Stambic, actually, who's going to be talking about mortgages. Thank oh, goodness. Yeah. He, he managed to join us today because I know a lot of people are asking about the mortgage. But do you get a lot of people, again, do you get cash buyers or are you getting mortgages as well? 
we get mortgages and we get cash buyers. Mostly cash buyers and mortgages are few. Okay. okay. Yeah. We work with Stambeg, um, APSA. Okay. Okay. And somebody's asked you a question here. Do you think Ghana should be considering building more affordable homes for its people? Yes, I agree with that. And I speak to Nanifi about it all the time. We have to. It's something, it's not like we are considering that you have to take that up in building affordable homes, let's say in the cities for the youth, for the young working class people. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and so where is um, Imperial Homes, you know, where are some of your main buildings? Uh, where, where are you building? Are you in Kumasi as well? Do you plan on going to Kumasi or is it just strictly in Accra? Currently we are in Accra, but we are planning to go to Kumasi. Yay! It's in the pipeline. <laughs> <laughs> in the pipeline. We are coming. Good. Are coming. Fantastic. Coming. We have a few lands there that we are trying to put together some few affordable and Kumasi style homes. We are coming. Okay, so somebody's actually, you know, the question I was thinking, somebody's asked it as well. And will it just be um, Kumasi? Will you go to Takrade, Cape Coast, or any plans of that? Um, yes, we, we are. We are. Yeah, we are thinking. I think we, we considered Takrade a, a year, some years back, but um, we just didn't go yet. But we are we, we, on it. Okay, so I'm going to put all our guests back on and I'm going to have Yaz there. Uh, let me see. Okay, Nana, are you here? I'm here. Not, can you see? Not Nana, I'm wondering whether okay. my staff, okay. uh, I think he's on mute. Um, Hello. Hi, Nana. Hi. How are you? I'm good. Yourself? I'm fine, thank you. I knew I I know I called you impromptu, um, but you know I felt like you know having this conversation. We can't have it without you know um, having our uh, the other side mortgage. You know, when somebody is thinking of buying a property in Ghana, um, what should they be looking out for? And typically, how does a mortgage work? In Ghana. But before you, you you speak, I would like to, first of all, if you can introduce yourself, where you work and what you do. I know you're a diaspora as well. So you're somebody that moved from the UK and, you know, came to, um, went to Ghana. So can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay. I uh, um, in 2013, um, yeah. I used to work with Barclays in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, I'm working now with Stambik Bank. I look after the international banking business and also diaspora banking. Okay. So um, mainly I do international banking, but um, as I said, um, I help the diaspora who are looking to buy property back home to manage to get um, their dream homes. So I think I work with almost all the estate agents um, I do a few fairs. Um, I do a few um, interactions with um, some of the diasporas in either churches or wherever places we, we find the diaspora. So um, that's basically what I do with Stambik. Yeah. Okay. So, Nana, so somebody in the diaspora, they want to buy a property from Imperial Homes or from the Greens what is the process? What d documents do you need? What do we need to know to buy a property in Ghana? Um, for the diaspora, the first thing you need to do is to be an account holder of Stambik Bank. So we'll help you um, open a bank account um, and basically start from there. <clears throat> Some people search for their properties themselves or our mortgage team can also help you to look out for um, properties within your price range. Mm -hmm. um, then we basically start the mortgage process where um, you basically need your 20% deposit um, and a little extra to take care of all the admin stuff. Um, 
we basically apply for the mortgage for you. Um, you need your pay slips, at least six months pay slips, mm -hmm. um, six months bank statements. And um, we need to know what you're doing. And it's mainly for, at the moment, for um, those who are fully employed so that at least we have a track record of what um, um, your incomings are, et cetera, et cetera. So with that, we um, sit with you, go through the application process, and if you are successful, then you can um, buy through us. Okay. And Nana, typically, obviously, it's COVID-19, and a lot of people have, you know, have lost their jobs um, and, you know, are unable to probably pay some of the, their mortgages. What happens in, that, in those scenarios um, for people who, who get caught up in these things? I think on that basis, it will be a case-by-case -case basis that would look at these things. Um, there are a few waivers here and there, but um, it, it will be done on a case-by-case -case basis. So depending on where you sit within, within, within the, uh, uh, the repayment that you have, um, we would basically do the assessment. So it's basically if you gave us the story around why or when you're looking to probably get some funds to repay, I'm sure it would work from there. So it's not cast in stone as to whether you'd get a waiver or not. Um, somebody's asked a question here. Um, what types of interest rates do mortgages come with in properties in Ghana? I think the rates are a bit flat, around 12, 12.5% are the rates for the dollar. Um, they differ for uh, the uh, city. But for the dollar, I think it's been level for quite a while, around 12 to 12.5%. Okay. Okay. And so typically, you know, when somebody is looking for a property, can they actually just come to Stambit Bank and you can actually suggest some property developers for them to purchase properties from? How does it, how does it work? What type of advice do you give for the diaspora? We, we can do that, but then um, it's, it's not part of what we actually do. But I think because there's a good relationship with... Um, because there's a good relationship with um, developers, we'll probably be able to put you through to a few developers to go look at the properties and then decide from there. Okay, okay. Somebody's put a question on here. I have always wondered if an inv individual earn, who earns 2,000 Ghana City can get the down payment for family, can they still get a mortgage, basically? with that um if you haven't got your eight um what you got 20 percent um you wouldn't be able to borrow because we need you to have some form of commitment in that property that you are going to buy um from us okay so there's no there's no going around it you have to basically find the money for the yeah we we, we wouldn't do a hundred percent um uh what you call a mortgage Okay. Did you used to do 100%? Because I know in the UK, they used to do 100%, and I think they've also stopped. I think that's um, one of the issues that came up in the financial crisis in around 2008. So um, it wouldn't be a responsible thing to do at this time. Mm -hmm. Nana, you know, so our, our topic that we've been discussing is looking at, you know, um, the youth that want to invest in properties um, and inland, what would your advice be to, you know, the youth out there um, that really want to get into um, this space? Hmm. Um, I think the first thing to look at is affordability. Um, Are you saying cut your coat according to your size? Definitely. <laughs> Def definitely. Okay. Yeah, definitely. And especially with someone like me who has lived in the UK, I understand it that way. Um, there are a lot of um, expensive, um, luxurious properties that one can buy in Ghana. But um, as a 
person starting life, um, I don't think you fit in into that category yeah. as yet. Yeah. You, you, you need, you need to be realistic. Um, you can grow from there. Um, similarly, uh, in the stages where people will buy an affordable property, um, change career, and more, move into a, a luxurious apartment, grow older, and basically children leave home, um, downsize, and go for a smaller property. Uh, yeah. If you look at the financial planning, that's basically the curve that it takes. But yeah. if you want to start by going for a luxurious property to start off with, um, mm -hmm. it may be a mismatch. So um, for the youth that are coming up and for some of the um, uh, fairs I went to, I had uh, similar discussions with a lot of people. And even the older people who are looking to relocate back to Ghana, um, my advice has been to look for affordable properties because the last thing you want to do is to buy a property um, now whilst you're coming back to Ghana um, only to retire and still have a mortgage to pay um, or debt in front of you. It wouldn't make life comfortable enough for you. Um, if you have good financial planning advice, you would basically look at uh, buying a property which is affordable and being able to pay it off even before you retire. Um, for the diaspora, my advice has always been that because you are in a situation where you've got a property, a primary home in the UK or in the US, um, Ghana becomes more like a holiday home. Um, so you, you, you basically have to, you know, spend what is right for a holiday home. You, your mm -hmm. holiday home probably might not be more expensive than your 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 primary home and most of them from the diaspora still have a mortgage to pay um mm -hmm. so you need to make sure that whatever you're buying um you will be able to pay it off and probably retire and use that as a retirement home or whatever it is so it, you need to look at your your finances to be able to um ascertain which property is best for you and I would say if you're starting, depending on your income, I think you can start from low. Um, you can sell up and move on to another property in the future um, if you qualify to live that luxurious life. Okay. Um, Nana, you know, some, some people are saying, you know, the 12.5 mortgage interest sounds very high. Why is this? I think it's the market in which we are. So if you look at Stambik, you look at um, HFC, Ghana Home Loans, all, all the rates are the same. They are basically around the same. And um, they haven't moved for, for a while. And that's the market we have at the moment. But um, for the diaspora, I keep telling them that um, we have low rates in the UK, low rates in the US. Bank of England, Bank of America rates are extremely low and basically these rates mimic what the Bank of uh, England, Bank of America rates would be. Um, mm -hmm. Ghana mimics what the Bank of Ghana rates are, which are quite high. So for me, find something which is affordable, aim to pay it off earlier. Most of us that stomach would not have any, um, what do you call it, uh, charges for you coming out of the mortgage earlier. So you can take out the mortgage, Paid off quickly, and from there um, you don't owe any any anybody, and it will be comfortable for you to probably repay it off um, at a at a much cheaper rate than um, what the twelve point five is. Okay. Um, somebody's also said, what's the interest rate of fixed deposit um, at Stambik Bank? Uh, fixed deposits all are tiered, so um, it depends on how much you're you're bringing in. Um, anything from like 8% you can get something but if you're looking for long term you can look at maybe um, treasury deposits or um, to look at Stanley which is um, our investment um, uh, portfolio which also offers you um, a cash uh, cash trust 
or um, there's two main investments. A cash trust basically is an easily accessible investment, but it's for long term and it's a tracker. It tracks the, the treasury deposit. So it is able to give you circa 2% above um, the treasury deposit rate. So it's, it's much more attractive than um, going in for a treasury deposit. Um, it has more liberty of taking out um, easily than you do for a treasury deposit. So you have more access accessibility to those funds and you have a better rate um, of return on that as well. Okay. Um, somebody also asked, do you have any distressed homes um, for, for sale at all? We do sometimes. Um, we do sometimes, uh, but I we 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 are we are um, we don't have a list of it at the, at this time. But um, if there's somebody looking for any, and they contact the mortgage team, they okay. probably will be able to give you some names or some uh, properties that are on the distress list that they could basically show you, and if you're interested, buy from there. Okay, okay. Somebody said, um, um, Luke Dadson is, you know, um, so what is the actual process of getting a mortgage in Ghana? How long does it take? You know, I know you mentioned about six months bank statement, you know, but typically how long does it take to get a mortgage for a property? Um, it takes, it takes um, a little while. It could, it could take, it could take uh, three months-ish wow. to, to be able to to get it. Um, I think it's the the documentation from like your lands, your um, surveys and et cetera, et cetera, which impacts on the time as well. But um, if everything that you need is available, yeah, you should be able to get it in, in quite a good time. We're now going to go through some questions. There's been a lot of questions. Um, if we mind starting at the top um, of the questions that people have for our guests, we're now into two hours, so I'm just going to go into um, the questions now and people can um, answer them and we can get on our way. Um, but if you are, I hope you're all enjoying the show this evening. Um, it's been very interesting and I'm so glad I've been able to get um um nana on the on the call um so what are the terms as far as length of the mortgage can you give an example of what could be expected as far as monthly payment if one financed a home for a hundred thousand dollars okay um we have a mortgage term of up to 20 years um so we could allow you to take a mortgage for a 20-year term but the 20 year end uh, ends at the at your retirement age. Um, for Ghana, it is 60, but I think for UK, I think we've allowed it to go up to 65. Mm. So depending on how old you are, um, if you were, let's say 50 years, then you can only have maybe 15 years if you were in the UK. But in Ghana, you would probably have only 10 years um, as a mortgage. Um, for a hundred thousand um, dollars, I think you're looking not less than a thousand dollars a month is what you probably be looking at. Um, and your twenty thousand dollars as uh, a deposit for for the property purchase. Okay, somebody's asked a very interesting question: Are there a prop? Are there property auctions in Ghana? Do you know in the UK we have property auction? Um, do we have this in Ghana? We don't have an established one. Wow. So that's somebody that's something that somebody could actually set up. Mm. Right? Because if you if you if Stambic has some distressed homes that you know an organization that can set up and get all of these listed, they can then auction these properties for you. I think the banks um, normally use newspapers to um, um, advertise some of these um, properties that they've um, repossessed. Mm -hmm. So yes, definitely, if it's organized into one one good unit or somebody is there looking at those properties to sell, I'm sure, yeah, there, there could be a good market for it. Okay. 
Um, can you read Alberta's um, question? She said, what will you advise on buying a home, um, a house? Would it be better to build from scratch um, to suit the person? Anybody want to answer um, that? <laughs> it, it's, it's a funny one. Um, yeah. For me, I built before I came, but um, I, I keep saying to most of the, the DAS runs that um, you have to be lucky if you want to build. It is, it is, it is a real hard work. Mm. Um, dealing with even the artisans is crazy. Um, very stressful. It, it is very stressful. Very stressful. So um, it, it, the the margins or the the difference in price from what you buy from a developer and um, what you spend your time doing, I think that 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 time, that stress, that sacrifice that you put in, I think that uh, difference in price makes up for it. So if it's a house you're looking for um you might as well um buy the bullet and just get um uh, a developed property i think that's the advice i'll i'll give you yeah um, and I'm not gonna ask the also <laughs> also what we we can do for those who are bent on building their own um is if we give you a mortgage we can give you a mortgage to buy or to build the house oh okay so we do um, 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 what do you call it um, uh, a mortgage facility for for building, but then that those funds are going to go to a contractor who's going to build that property for you. Okay. So we have an option for that as well. Okay, and and somebody asks, can they apply for the diaspora uh, bank account at Stambic online? Is it online to open a bank account for the? They could. Um, there's a little hitch now. Um, if you already have um, a, a TIN number, um, then you can do most of most of the account opening um, online. But if you don't have a TIN number, you need to apply for a TIN number and use that to open the account. So that's where there's a limitation. Um, Normally, if you speak to our customer service, hello, hello, yeah, I can hear yeah. you. If if you if you speak to the the Stambic, um customer service on online as well, they'd probably be able to guide you through the application process. Otherwise, um, if they come um, directly to to the bank, we'll be able to do that for them. Can you describe what a TIN number is for those in the diaspora who may not know what a TIN number is? Okay, um, there's a new regulation, or it has been around for a while, but it's become compulsory now for each individual in Ghana to have a tax identification number, which is called a TIN, T-I-N number. Um, I think most people who used to probably come into clear goods from the hub or used to have access to those one or they could apply for that for you but now every individual needs to have one so for every bank account you need to have or you need to state that number on that on that form so normally when you come in to open the account for us we will probably give you um, the form to fill go to inland revenue and get it done and you can bring the number to us for us to open the um the bank account for you Okay. Um, somebody said, just say, says, what about the mortgage uh, percent rate for cities? Is there anything for cities? Yes, we do cities. Um, cities, it's about 20, I, I, I haven't got the, 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 the current rate now, so I'm not, uh, not quoted, but we do mortgages in cities. Okay, okay, all right. Yeah. Um, please, if the person doesn't want mortgage and she wants to buy straightforward, is that possible for Kieran? Is that possible? Uh, can they buy cash? Yes, it's possible. Okay. Yes. Okay. okay. And same for, for you, Genevieve. Somebody can just buy um, a cash payment. Yes, it is possible. Once you 
like what you are buying and you meet the price level, why not? You can always pay cash. Even in installments, it's fine. We take it. Okay. Oh, okay. So you do installments as well? Yes, we do. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, but I guess you can't move in until you've paid fully. Very well. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I understand. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, um, uh, uh, Nana, you know, Ben yeah. says, you know, bro, if you've lived in the UK, then sincerely um, believe that you should help to make, to help to, wait, should help. Uh, <laughs> basically i think he's saying that look you used to live in the uk you've moved to ghana and you're working for stambit you should help to try and reduce these costs for you know us who's who yes <laughs> and Anna? the interest rate as i said <laughs> across board um whether it's hfc uh, ghana home loan stambic and i'm sure apsa as well it's it's the market that determines the rates and the market at this point in time is indicating that for the dollar and for uh the dollar and the pound so it is it, it's it's not something one person or one bank could just go in and adjust it, it, it won't work that way yeah okay and um for me as i said um when i speak to the, the diaspora i keep re-emphasizing that Ooh. okay it, it's more of a, a personal story than anything else but um we 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 need we we have the dreams for luxury which everybody has but we also need to be realistic and that's that's my first point of call um disposable income in the uk the us is very very small so if you're looking to buy a a huge property because maybe that's what you feel is is, is luxurious enough for you you need to check on you know whether that's really realistic for you affordable for you um does it fit in with your budget and if not, um, most of the time, you're probably spending a month maximum in Ghana on holidays. Two weeks, three weeks, that's what you spend out of a year. So that should also come into your analysis when you are buying. Um, and as well, when you are abroad and you're looking to come back home as well, um, a lot of the time we look at four-bedroom, five-bedroom, because I've got children, I've got X, Y, this is what I want to do. But if you really look into it well, is it that necessary? Mm. If it is not, look at something, one, two bedroom, which is affordable, buy, paid off. And if you have to retire, you retire and live in there. Because probably by the time you retire, your children have moved off home. Um, if they are moved out of home, it's you and your wife or probably you alone um, in the five bedroom house. Now you want to downsize. It becomes another issue altogether. So for those living abroad, looking to come back home, let's look at realistic, you know, prices, realistic, you know, size of property and buy that so that you can pay it off within uh, the shortest possible time and own that property. Okay, so Kieran, we have a question for you. Does your company property, does, do they do property management services as well? I.e. if I bought a two bedroom and I wanted to rent that out, um, would you be able to do that? Because they're not based yes. in that. Yes, we definitely do give that service to our clients. Okay, okay. Yes. Okay, and um, Genevieve, do you do that as well? You know, if somebody wants to buy and rent, um, do you do property management as well? Yes, we do property management. About 60% of our customers are not in Ghana as well, even though they are Ghanaian. So we do property management. We have a um, facility management company as well. So we, we have a full package for you. We do rental as well. We will help you rent your property out. Okay. Stephanie, do you do that as well for your properties? Yes, please. We do. You do. 
Okay. Okay. And what are Can I just add? Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, I I meet a lot of um diasporans who sort of want to use property purchase as a form of investment. And my advice has always been um, that if you're looking to buy for rental, you should have the funds for vacant periods. So anybody looking to buy should not be looking to buy thinking that they're using the rent to repay the mortgage because you, you get a lot of people caught in the middle because that's the plan. Um, what I advise is, regardless of the rent you're going to receive, do you have funds to pay on a monthly basis? If, you, if the answer is yes, then you can go ahead and basically um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, use that as an investment vehicle. If you don't have the means to repay on a monthly basis, then it's not an advisable investment vehicle to go for because you can have vacant periods and the vacant periods can be for long periods. And if there are vacant periods for long periods, who's going to pay the mortgage for you? Then you become, you know, uh, an issue for the bank. Um, it's stressful and it's not worth it. Um, worst case scenario, repossession comes in, um, you probably will lose quite a lot of your, your capital because um, it probably may not be sold for um, the, the amount you're looking for. So advice is, if you're looking to go into property and use it as rental, the rental should rather be a bonus, not the main source of repayment for um, the property. Okay. Um, somebody has says, how does the bank help for you who want to start real estate business? For the bank? Um, startup business is not too um, attractive for the bank. Okay. So if you're looking at a startup, um, unfortunately, I don't think... Um, uh the bank will be the best place to to be um but the bank helps existing businesses with track record um with huge funds uh we we basically help from uh funds to do the buildings funds to patches vehicles all that but the risk of startup is is a bit too high so um it depends anyway if if you've got a, a a good a good business plan definitely we'll probably look at it but um uh, that's that's basically what i can say yeah okay jessica says what are the pros and cons in purchasing an apartment in ghana kieran genevieve steph anyone Pros and cons of purchasing an apartment. Oh, Nanekia, yeah. anyone want to delve into Yeah, that? I think this question has a lot more um, maybe follow-up questions. Are you talking about purchasing an apartment for yourself? Um, are you living in Ghana? Are you looking at it as an investment property? Um, those will really help. That's what will inform whether it's a good idea or, you know, a bad one. Um, yeah. So maybe the, the one asking the question, Jessica, can let us know what exactly you're looking at testing the apartment for. And I think um, we can give you an appropriate answer. Okay, Kieran, it says, um, how much will your house rent for per month in terms of for someone looking at buying and renting as an investment? Uh, so our community is uh, halfway completed. So after 125 houses, we've built 55. We are now to start doing the recreational area. So right now, uh, I would say we are mid-completion. We are already getting rentals for between five to six hundred dollars per month, where the clients are paying a year in advance, and then there is a service charge also attached to that. So that already we are already getting that. But we are also encouraging ourselves to rent. 
we'd rather rent for the investors. So, I mean, although we've got, we'd rather sell our property and then let the buyers, you know, take advantage of the rental rather than us as developers with our finished units. Okay, okay. Um, what are developers doing to ensure that houses are affordable for the average Ghanaian to reduce the extremely high housing deficiency? Anyone? Anisha, I think you should do this. Um, so this question went to the developers and the quad developer. Um, so the high... Um, the high cost of housing, and this is a, a, a problem, I think it's, it's a general problem. Um, typically, for urban, um, for how the, the, the city is, is managed, in other places in the entire year in the UK, you realize that the, the state, the system itself is involved in housing its people. Um, typical, let's take a typical example. A developer, purchases the land. We all know what goes into purchasing the land. The land is usually, if you're going in a good location, is very expensive. The cost of construction, it's another thing. Most of the things we are using are imported because also we, we haven't industrialized enough to produce material here to make it affordable. Then on top of that, Mr. Nama already is here with his interest rate. <laughs> oh, you see, <laughs> So without, I mean, in most places, when it comes to affordability, it is not the developer that service their land, bring the electricity, do the road, so and so. All this comes, and they have to pass the cost down to you, the one who just goes somewhere to lay your head. So ideally, there should be an active participation of the state. It should not be that um, young people, startup people, are faced with the only option of accommodation two, three hours from the city centre, where whether you like it or not, your job is going to be. Quality of life is a big problem. Ideally, it is the people who can afford the top executive in the bank, who doesn't need to be at the office at 8 a.m. to talk in, who can play golf before coming to work, should live in a corner cut two hours away. The other one, one that will have a wife for anyway. So in the end, we have that development in the reverse. So that rather the people who can afford it are living closer to their workplaces, living in, I mean, and even to just um, the young people are the ones, the startup lives are the ones with children who are going to school. So I mean, now the thing in Ghana, people have to wake up their kids at 4 a.m. They are eating breakfast in the car. Why? Because they look you know, mm. most of the time too far from, and it's not even sustainable and efficient. So if we ha if our state was actively involved, taking care of the things that a private developer should not have to take care of, so they can reduce the load on the buyer. That's a good thing. The other thing which um, I throw out to, you know, developers, even those um, in the good location, really typically when you're buying a house, like an um, appearance um, place, I don't know, do you do a complete furnishing, um, Kiran, for example? So that option also. So you have the clients also ask for, exactly. exactly. So we want to make the client's life, especially if they're in the diaspora, as easy as exactly. possible. So if we help them by renting, uh, managing, uh, furnishing, definitely we, are, we, we, do, we support them. These are options you do and you support them. But typically, if you were in for multiple, if you're buying a multiple, you're buying a property somewhere, and you buy a shell, you take your time. You know, we have to do it in such a way that the initial price does not overwhelm everyone. Mm. Um, exactly. So that if you are able to purchase at a certain level, take your time and grow into the house, you know, put it to your, to your like um, he's saying, be realistic about. Um, where you're going with this because in the end we pile on all this and then the end price everybody is running through like the, the person asking the person but it's really a something in the system and really affordability I will always say it's a policy issue it is not the architect it is not the developer 
It is the policy of the state. Okay. And that's at one point, at 21 years old, you could purchase a property because the opportunity was there. Yeah, it's true. In Ghana, that's almost impossible because the opportunity is not there. So the state needs to be actively involved in housing its people. And we saw it with Corona. Now we had to lock down and it was a problem because people don't have somewhere to stay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, that's my, my so somebody says, Romeo says, in some countries in Africa, um, in Africa banks have ceiling limits um, of the total amount of mortgage um, that they can give out. In Ghana, does banks have equal ceiling limits? Um, uh, is it that once you satisfy the criteria, you will get the mortgage? Nana? Um... <laughs> There, there isn't such a uh, like a ceiling itself, but it has to be within your affordability, and um, your your earnings should be able to prove um, beyond doubt that whatever is given to you will be repayable within the time frame that we've asked you to repay it. Okay, um, what is the percentage yield return on investment? Anyone? Around seven to nine percent, depending on the property. Okay. Does that go to you as well, Genevieve? Yes, it pays actually. Yeah. Okay. Okay. What are the lifespan of these buildings? Hmm. Ingenious. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, the engineers. Where is um let me see? Yeah, yeah, okay. is, uh, yeah oh. I think I've lost you. Yeah. Oh that yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah what, what is the lifespan of some of these um, um properties? So um there's a totality of everything that goes into a building. Um electrical cables at a point had a lifespan of 20 years. So one of the aspects of my work is to do audits of existing buildings. And what we do is when, for instance, if there's a, a building that needs to be uh, reoccupied or change of occupancy, so somebody has a residential facility and wants to change it to a commercial facility, we come in and do an audit of the, of the building. Mm -hmm. If the building has been around for less than, say, 20 years, we do an existing condition of items that are in there to determine if there's a good space. Now, um, every item in there has a lifespan. Generators have a lifespan. Air conditioning has a lifespan. So you do a total audit of the building to determine the actual state of it. So usually we'll say about 20 years, but it's important to actually do a total audit, including um, structural audits as well. Okay, okay. So <clears throat> structural audits as well that you do? Oh yeah, you do a structural integrity test of building. Wow. So, and if you came in and you wanted to invest in a building that's already existing, you don't just come in and then see where the documents are and then sign off. You need to get engineers to come and do a proper assessment of the building. Even if the building has only been in existence for two years, you would need the as-built conditions of the building at the time of handing over. You would need to see if there's been any maintenance on the building logged in over a period. And then you'd also need the engineers to come in to do these assessments and determine the state of the building as well. Okay, thank you so much. Um, will the bank allow two or more persons on a mortgage? Yeah, we, we could do a joint mortgage for you. Okay, so that's possible. Okay. Um, um, yeah, can you read this? Um, so I said, certainly we need state policy reforms to address housing challenges. It's messy as more people are dwelling in slums all over Accra. Absolutely. So um, I'm very passionate about policy. And I currently sit as vice chairman for the National Engineering Coordinating Team. One of the things that we address nationally is to ensure that not only just the road reservations, which have been encroached on by um, encroachers, 
but you realize that when people are encroaching in these spaces, they're also taking off the spaces that belong to utility services. So if there's a master plan for this nation where we're running water, we're running electricity, we're running fiber cable, the moment people are selling off these properties, you're encroaching on properties that have been reserved for utility services. So the idea is to make sure that we're coordinating these efforts. Um, and this must be policy driven. It must be legally backed and it must be policy driven as well. So it's very important that um, our state machinery works and we work hand in hand with all the agencies. So Ghana Highway Authority, Urban Roads, we're working with LUSPA, uh, which used to be town and country planning. Um, oh, yeah. We're working with the agencies and um, we're hoping that there's going to be some change. Okay. Kieran, do you allow for flexibility in building Typo, typologies. Um, I don't know what he's trying to say in your community, i.e. can somebody purchase a plot of land in your gated community at Tema and develop their own house with different, um, no, I don't think you allow that, do you? No, thank you. <laughs> then, uh, no. Yeah. Um, no, uh, Barney, they don't allow that. I think that you'd have to buy your own um land and and build it how you want to be built um, um you know how you want it to be built but i think that you know they have a standard of you know the type of buildings you know if they get nana nana kriya to come and you know do a, a design they wouldn't want your design in the middle of it just you know looking uh, uh, different from the rest and so i I've, I've, I've actually answered your question for you i don't need to hear from kieran <laughs> with that one um what else do we have do you have a do you have do they have a construction pack for these buildings i'm not, not sure what, oh sorry so i'm not sure what he means or yeah he means by construction pack um i think i'm thinking he means that from the design, do, do you have yeah. anything else attached to the design? Maybe the building, you help the person build, you know, something the Napier mentioned earlier. I think that's what he's trying to say. So I think I think I there's know. a design and build, there's a design and build approach sometimes. So um, maybe Nanepia can touch on it, but we also happen to do design and build sometimes. So and then we're linked to okay. contractors who can also okay. I don't know if um um, what I'm understanding also by the question, unfortunately, the question is quite ambiguous. So we are all trying to understand it um, as we can. But it's he's probably talking about after construction, like uh, the nani what we do with the as built. So you have the as built drawing that shows you um to do that for that shows you where all your cables are running, where um everything is, and then of course the warranties on different aspects of the building. So basically. As part of buying the, the house, this comes, you know, so you know what to do with the house. Going back to the issue of lifespan, I think that's another thing. Um, people don't realize that maintenance is part of owning the house. Um, so a lot of times you feel like once it's there, that should be the end of it. If you, it lasts as long as you make it last. Beyond the, the um you know, the lifespans and all these things. You also have to put in a certain effort in maintaining a house to stay, you know, viable for, for a period. So that's... Nanokia and Yad, do we have also, like, sanitation issues when building some of these things? I mean, what, 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 what goes into it? Because, you know, our gutters and all of that, you know, can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Um, so... <laughs> So there's a reason why when we're doing most of these development, we work with civil engineers and then we also work with the municipal assembly. So for instance, um, we in our firm, for instance, uh, we have we're mechanical and electrical engineers. So we have plumbing uh, aspects where we do all the plumbing work. And then we work with a civil engineer to look at the storm drainage system as well. So everything to do with the uh, immediate surroundings of the building. We need to seek permits from the Metropolitan Assembly. And so we send our plans to them. They determine whether we're close to a central sewage line. And if we're not, we need to provide them with the act 
actual plan or the actual decision on how you're going to dispose of your waste. So it's the, it's the reason you need to work with professionals. If you go ahead and do these things on your own, you wouldn't know that there's a process. Ghana has a building code now. In the last two years, um, it's been in full force now. We have proper Ghana building code. We've moved from the national building regulation to the Ghana building code. And all these things are stipulated in there. You need professionals who have actually read through these, have contributed to this national code, and are able to tell you what is required for you. Nanipia was talking about certificate of occupancy. Before the building is handed over to you, as professionals, we do the testing and commissioning and ensure that the building is ready for occupancy. So there's a lot of things that goes into building. And um, if we're going to sit here, it'll probably take uh, the whole day. But I think, I think when, you, when people are ready to involve themselves in proper construction, they should look into talking to professionals, people who are well-versed in the industry. Oh, okay. So I think I'm going to take five more questions and we are done for tonight. Um, you know, our guests do have other things that they need to do and we've gone overboard as always. And I, I guess we'll need a part two to this because the questions are many as always. It looks like every dental show, I need a part two, part three, part four. Um, and so um, I'm going to take five more um, from Chrissy. So one is from Kojo. Uh, Apenting, and his, he says, is there a different set of requirements for first-time buyers from both the banks and the developers' viewpoint? So I'll start with um, Nana Stambi. Um, there, there is. Um, I know. I know what the question means. Um, I think um, from the UK perspective, and from I'm sure America, first-time buyers are given discounts. Um, yeah. uh, given several uh, different things but um unfortunately that's not the case here um i think it's it's quite a level playing field in in ghana so you basically need to have um uh, a regular employment that basically tells us that in the next foreseeable future you will be having enough income to repay the mortgage that we're going to offer you you need your twenty percent deposit, and um, I think you are you are quite good to go. Okay, I think I'll. I think that basically covers it for the developers as well, right? Yeah, I don't think yeah. And also, I think what, what we also do is because of the independent uh, valuation of the property, we are also making sure that whatever property you're looking to buy is good enough for us as well as for yourself, so that in 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 case there's a default we know we are not left with um, a defunct property that we have to um, now look at either repairing to resell or whatever. So at least we, we know that whatever you're buying is from a reputable company and it is, you know, fit for purpose, basically. Okay. Yeah, this question is for you. Are buildings in Ghana engineered to be energy efficient? Are we using more solar panels, I think? Um, uh, like insulated to reduce the cost of electricity from the constant use of um, air conditioning. Okay, I, I see that Nebuchadnezzar is laughing because this is one of the conversations we constantly have when we're doing uh, design reviews. You know, um, one area that both of us are very passionate about is sustainable buildings and green building systems. Um, it's a matter of cost. There's solution for a lot of things. Um, when we usually do designs for clients and we go through the client's brief, the first thing we bring to the presentation is energy efficiency. Mm -hmm. And we discuss with them the solutions that are available and the cost margins in the solution. Most of the developers are looking to save money at the first time cost because most of them are trying to sell these buildings and walk away with a profit. So there are several ways to actually envelope the building there are several ways to orient the building. There are several ways to actually build with material that will reduce the energy consumption of the building. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of buildings these days are being certified either by LEED or by the Green Building Council or whatever. And we are highly involved in that. But unfortunately, people who are building are looking at the cost. And so they are not able to put the, the foot the bill. Luckily, yeah. there are businesses that are in the energy efficiency industry. So for instance, if you're looking to put up a building that has a one megawatt capacity, clearly, oops, 
sorry, sorry. Clearly, if you are looking to do solar on your own, it's going to cost you a fortune. So there are solar companies that are saying, you know what, we would come and do these installations for you at our cost. And we're going to bill you as though we're billing you for um, utility service for a period of time after which we transfer the services to you. So it's a build or operate transfer type of system. And um, it's working. I mean, a lot of the commercial buildings you find with solar are actually working on that system where they have said to the solar company, come and do this. You, uh, serve as a utility company within our services, charge us, we'll pay for these services in 20 years, you'd hand over the building to us and we no longer have to worry about power. Okay. Um, does the government offer tax holidays to local companies or Ghanaians abroad who want to go into real estate or any other business um, as, offered foreign, as offered to foreign companies? Nana? Um, not that I'm aware of, um, yeah. unless you're probably looking at a, a free zones board sort of um, arrangement, um, there isn't going to be any tax holidays on setting up a, a real estate um, business in Ghana. But if, if it falls within the free zones, I'm sure those would have... Uh, a different tax implication. Okay. Um, Jacqueline um, Buff Buffo says, does it come with two years customer? Oh, Chrissy, can you bring that question back? Um, does it come with um, two year customer care and 10 years structural care, like new buildings in the UK? That um, is not the case, but in Imperial Homes, we do one year customer care okay. and one year structural care, but okay. we don't go beyond one year. I know some companies do six months, but we do one year. We do one year. Okay. I was, was going to say. We have, um, but we have um, homeowners association, so after the one year, they take care of everything afterwards. Okay. <laughs> Yes. No, so even building is Sorry. Um, typically, construction comes with a six months prefix liability period, okay. plus okay. a rental. So even if even if you're not uh, buying from an, a developer or something, typically your contractors should be um, bound to you for at least six months plus the rental, so that in that period, because it's you know, a building needs to be used like everything else to be tested. So while you you start using it um, in that period, you can fall back on your contractor to make good any defects that appear for the six months. You are also holding some portion of the money due them, after which you can, and then six months plus the rain. So if there hasn't been a rain in the six months after it's handed over, you wait for a rain for this period to elapse. And then if everything is fine, you can pay them their final um Final money, and then you're, you're good. So, so even without a company like in Prems, one year or someone given ten years, you are you have the six months. You have like, a six months guaranteed. Exactly. And then, tell one of the things that as engineers we also look out for is when we're doing. So we do our own specifications. We do our own bills of quantity where yeah. we determine the the items that are going into the bills um, to be priced for. In selecting the contractor to work. With, one of the things that we also look out for are warranties to ensure that um, equipment of certain sizes have a certain lifespan and warranty issues. So if you work with professionals who know the industry and can understand how these equipment actually function, you know very well that you can have a generator warranty for a certain number of years, air conditioning, so and so. So it all comes back to testing and commissioning and then the warranty systems as well. Okay. Ni nee says, are there are any of these homes wheelchair accessible? Because as we know, you know, in Ghana, I don't think that we take um, into consideration a lot of people with wheelchair and disabilities. Um, it, are you guys doing that with your homes? Kieran, if I get you to answer first. Not really. Unless it's a special request. Okay. Uh, it's not something, unfortunately, that we really put in our designs. 
Yeah, I mean, the whole thing that is um, with the disability act um, that we we it's something we have to do. Um, of course, for us as architects, in designing is part of something we consider. Um, uh, so yeah, it, it's catching on. Eventually, it will be law. You will have to have um, disability access um, for buildings. I mean. And it's not just wheelchairs. It's more than wheelchairs. So for the blind, that um, uh, how they can also move around, even in the urban context. So things like the sound of pavements at points where you can um, there's an opening to cross the road, the zebra crossing. The the material used there would sound different. The material used on the ground. So it's very technical. There's a lot actually that we should do, and it's being pushed now in the legal system so that it will be part of every development in the country. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and in Nigeria homes, we do we do we do have that. Okay. Yeah. Oh. We do have that. You do have wheelchair accessibility for yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. for all our designs. Oh yeah. fantastic. Actually, actually the entire it's covered in the Ghana building code. Um, yes. In the new code, it's a requirement. And for instance, when we do lift designs for buildings that are above a certain number of levels, it's required to ensure that there's a lift in there. Never. And there's no lift. Even for a two-level building, we ask that there should be a ramp. So some of these new regulations, people need to be mindful of them because it's, it's in there. Okay. Okay. And it comes back to working with Yes, working with professionals, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, how easy or hard is it to build a real estate business? What should one be prepared to face? <laughs> Anyone, Nana? <laughs> I think you need the capital. Okay. Uh, as the biggest one, and um. <laughs> you need you need a good workforce, and you'll be able to survive. Uh, it's 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 quite capital intensive. Um, mm -hmm. I know a lot of people want to get into the real estate in uh, business, but it's very capital intensive. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of um, risks associated to this business. Um, selling is not easy. So you probably have properties which would be locked on your side for probably years before you have to, um, or you get buyers to buy. So if you are, let's say, lending to um, build, for example, where are you going to get the money to repay um, for the, 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 the loans you've taken? So it's, it's quite a very heavy, you know, capital intensive business you need you need a lot of fun to be able to survive in that business that's what i would say yeah. yeah and kieran i mean you're in it so how how what advice would you give somebody that wants to start their own uh definitely like nana mentioned it's uh, capital intensive so managing your cash flow is key um i would advise strongly to uh, try and have a very lean uh, structure and overhead because that also reflects on you know the end price of your product and uh, go slow I mean if you're if you're depending on what your situation is grow organically because you should test the market one thing is what is on paper but, but when you actually start doing the work on the ground maybe you know you expected to sell 10 houses every month and then you see that maybe you're selling 10 houses every six months. It just changes the whole picture. So take it, take it gradually. And then you'll get, you, you'll keep learning and, and, and growing and doing better in every subsequent development. And you'll still make mistakes. Okay. <laughs> All right. In your opinion, what do you make of buildings that are done without any professional involvement? Are those buildings good for occupancy? All right, I will answer this. <laughs> I'll throw the question right back. What, in your opinion, do you think of a surgery done by a non-professional? Is it good? Do you think it will be good? This is my question. We cannot say um, for sure whether it's good or bad, but I won't stick my neck out. 
that it is good because I don't know. Um, there are things like uh, like Nani mentioned. Um, yeah, they are old <laughs> buildings. You know, you come on board before I touch an old building. We will make sure we've done a structural integrity. You've done all these things. Yeah, I was talking about because we can't guarantee that this building will do what we expect it to do. So as much as possible, start with professionals. Just go straight to the professional and get the value for your money because it will cost money. Okay. okay. And the other thing, oh, sorry, Denta, not to drag this, but the other thing is a lot of people, I always ask, why would you not want professionals on your project? And usually the answer is cost because I don't see why they need to pay someone to tell them what to do only for them to bring the actual people who will do the work to do the work. So why don't they go straight forward to the people who do the work? Now, my simple answer is, if I'm charging you 10 CDs for every 100 CDs that you are going to spend, the person who you're getting, an electrician who comes to you and tells you, for wiring your lighting, I'm going to use 2.5 mm cables. Do you even know what that is? Mm. Do you know whether you really need a 2.5 or you need a 1.5? So he's charging you 2.5 cost when I can come and advise you and say, you really do need a 2.5, you need a 1.5. Mm. So I'm saving you money that eventually would come back to your pocket. It, wouldn't, it would even offset my professional fees and save you more. Um, secondly, there are certified professionals who are supposed to even do installation. And these certified professionals, for instance, the Energy Commission now has certification systems for ele electricians. So even if you're not going to use a professional and you're going straight to an electrician, find out, are they even registered with the energy commission? First of all, mm. there's several things that goes into this. And um, I would say cost could never be Okay. Um, Nana, you have a question on the screen or? Hello. You have a question on the screen. Can you see it? Um, I think I answered that question from the start, saying okay. that you need to you need to get your twenty percent and other costs that would be incurred in in applying for the mortgage. So at, at the upfront, we are basically telling you um, that you need a range of funds to help you do that, so that you're you, you're prepared. So. Um, that those costs are additional and as i said we we also need you to be part of the deal it can't be us who are taking the 80 percent chunk um of the cost of the property also dipping into our pockets to get more um to fund it so your commitment is part of um that process basically okay and and nana what about this question can someone living and working in the U.S. apply for a mortgage from Stambik uh, on a house in Ghana? Yes, that's what my department does. Basically, um, our um, Ghanaians who live in the U.K., in uh, U.S., abroad, basically, uh, who are working, um, if you've got an account with us and you... Um, uh, basically provide all the documentation we need. Um, we'll be able to help you purchase a property or your dream home in Ghana. Okay. Can you answer this question as well? That's on the screen. Do property prices ever fluctuate in Ghana depending on demand and purchasing power or the only changes on increment and why so? <laughs> um. <laughs> That's why I needed you Probably. to read that one. That one you needed to read it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> property prices um no i understand i'm i'm sure all these questions are coming from the diaspora because um for myself when i got here i just thought you know this country is crazy with the prices that we quote for properties especially looking at the prices you see in the uk um uh, in the us um the the prices don't seem to go any lower because the dollar is also still going up and we are pricing in dollars we are importing the stuff to 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 build in dollars so unfortunately the prices seem not to go down but keep going upwards um it may change nobody knows but um at the moment that's what it is no no so he he responded and he said um he's uh, can you see what you know? 
what have been faced insurance valuations. Yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. That that's your commitment. The the costs, additional costs are your commitment in purchasing the property. So um, we will let you know that you need a certain amount of money in addition to the 20% to be able to go through the mortgage process. So as I said, you're buying the property. We basically are taking 80% of the cost and paying it to the developer on your behalf. And you are providing the 20% um, as your deposit. So the bank has spent a lot of money already. And that's what I'm saying that we also need your commitment in there. So those um, additional staff are, your, are part of your commitment in buying the property. Okay. Do you need collateral in order to secure the bank loan for the mortgage? No. Okay. And do you, do the bank um, support overpayments? If so, yes. how much percentage before penalties? Yes. And I, I think I said that as well in the okay. beginning that um, for the diasporans, I keep um, telling them that, listen, the 12.5% looks high. It was crazy for me myself when I came, but at the end of the day, if you plan to pay, you know, overpay, you can reduce the time span that you need to pay the the, the property off by. So if the 12.5 is bothering you, do overpayment, pay it down quickly, own the property in a shorter uh, period of time, and then at the end of the day, uh, you will not have paid that 12.5%. Uh, cumulatively, if you if you paid earlier, if you waited till the twenty year term, yes, then that full work will be felt. But if not, you can you can you can save yourself a lot of money by paying off much earlier. Okay, we do have to wrap up. I mean, it's been three hours. <laughs> it's been wow. three hours that we've been on, and it's it's good because we haven't even felt that it's three hours. It's because we've been engaged, people are asking questions. I'm sure that if my guests will come on the show again, we'll have to do a part two at some point because it looks like, you know, people are very, very interested in this field. And, you know, we haven't even answered half of the questions, but we do have to end it because I know everybody has busy schedules, but I want to hear your last words, Kieran, what do you have to say for people that are looking to invest in Ghana, for somebody like yourself who moved from Dubai to Ghana, set up and started your business in real estate? What advice would you give the young people who are coming up and want to invest? So my advice would definitely be to start as early as you can to put aside that 20% down payment that you need to put in in order to obtain your house and like nana said you don't have to go for that big or the ultimate dream house you can start small and build your portfolio and build yourself baby steps that would be my advice to them okay start now start saving that 20 percent now yeah, the time is now, as I keep saying, that's my slogan for the Dental Show this time around. The time is now. As people from the diaspora, we need to look back home. There are people from all over that are investing in Ghana. And what are you doing? You need to step up and the time is now to, um, to act. So, Kieran, thank you so much. Um, I will definitely give you a call after this. I'm going to take everybody off one by one. I've got work with the questions. Um, so, Kieran, thank you so much for joining us thank on you. the show. Okay, so, um, Genevieve, yeah. I'm in Imperial Homes. I love Imperial Homes. I've been promoting Imperial Homes for many years. You know, what is your advice to people who are watching at the moment that are, you know, thinking of buying? You know, what are the steps that they should take? Um, just like Karen said, they should have their twenty percent down payment ready, and if they want to use the, any of the financial companies for a mortgage, I mean, we can help them speak to Stambeck or AFSA for their mortgage, and we are available to help them through their documentations in getting their mortgages approved and getting a property from us. Is, Thank you. Is that okay thank you so much genevieve i hope you've enjoyed 
tonight's interview. It's a date. You've had a date with me for three hours, which you never do. <laughs> so this I is know, a date. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jen, and I'll see you on the other side. Okay, um, uh, I'll go to Nana Stambik. Nana, what would you, again, I know you've already given your advice kind of, but, you know, for somebody from the diaspora, again, you know, a Ghanaian um, that's moved back to Ghana, would you encourage um, Ghanaians abroad to come back home? Definitely. Um it's 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 a good move if you come at the right time um for me i've enjoyed every bit of um being back in ghana and um it's about um how you plan to live here um there are frustrations if you come back but um if you probably understand where you are you probably adjust to uh, where you are and with that I'm sure gradually you will sail through so for the diasporans I'll just say if you're looking to come back home or whilst I was in Barclays for the last 10 years before I came to Ghana um, my advice to a lot of especially the elderly were to ensure that you have a home back home um, where you retire because um, it's great to retire where where you were born or where where um, you come from. So um, as you rightly put, uh, now is the time. Um, if you haven't got a home back home, um, just start with us. Open account uh, an account with us. Have a savings account. Um, start saving your twenty percent deposit and your extra costs. Um, look out for properties around or speak to either our diaspora banking or our mortgage team. They would help you uh, locate um, reputable um, estate developers. And um, you can buy through us and hopefully pay it off before you retire, which is very important, um, so that by the time you retire, you have a, a home here in Ghana you can move back to. Um, the process is very easy. As I said, if you go to Stambik, um CCC and um, on Google, you can have contact numbers on there and speak to um, um, our customer service team. Otherwise, even if you came directly to me or anybody in my team, um, we'll basically provide you with um, application forms and support you through the application process and if you've opened the account, you have your deposit, um, you have um, a house in sight, uh, will make your dream come true. Oh, thank you so much, Nana, especially at such a short notice. You came and you represented so much. Um, thank you so much to Stambik, who I personally bank with as well. So Stambik all the way. Um, make sure that you get your account with Stambik to enable you to be able to get a mortgage with them. Um, thank you, Nana. And I will speak to you on the other side. Thank you, too. Okay, so Nana Oya, Nana Oya, Nana Oya. <laughs> Nana Oya. <laughs> I, <thought> that... <laughs> I know, I need to, I need Stephanie to, where is Stephanie? Oh, there's Stephanie. Okay, Stephanie, Steph, yeah. you started your journey yeah. at the age of 17. Have there been any regrets of starting, you know, your own your own career in your in your mind? And what has the challenges been for you that you would educate somebody not to go through the same process? Um, it hasn't been easy at all. Someone asked how easy or how hard it is. I still have a lot of things to learn, and every time I learn, and I realize some things, some four key points that are my notes all the time I remember is I need to learn before I am, then I save and invest. Hmm. All right. So uh, first and foremost, get educated. That's what I would tell everybody that wants to invest in real estate or want to invest in it as a business, what they want to do. People look at these rich people and go like, I want to be rich like this person. <laughs> but I have you asked yourself, are you ready to put in the time, the efforts, the values. 
the investment goes beyond just the cash, putting in the money. You can get partners, but then if you lack the value of hard work, the value of working smart, you won't be productive, right? So you have to put all that in line. It goes beyond that. It's, it's a decision to make. Are you ready to let go of certain things and feel it in the skin that this is what I want to do? So that's that's what I would tell everybody. And with um, like Nana said, it's capital intensive. That is so true. But there are a lot of ways you can save. There are a lot of um, things you can do to put up your capital and multiply it in so many ways. Like having some side hustle. I do a lot of things aside this. <laughs> I sell pins, I sell doors, I sell towels, I sell... You pins. go, girl. Yeah. <laughs> I do a lot of things. I do a lot of things to save. Because from where I'm coming from, there are a lot of people that have the opportunities. Like, their parents have this billion dollar there waiting for them to bring up an idea. But I don't really have that. Although we are just comfortable. And I have an uncle that is always behind me that would support whatever thing that I do. But so I know I have to save, I have to learn a lot. I have to do this, do that to be able to save and let's go spending so much, you know. Um, the other time we had a conversation, Mrs. Venta, if you remember, I yeah. told you um, there are a lot of my friends that, you know, when they sell, they sell something or they are into some small business, when they hit the jackpot of some 5,000, so you see them at Movem Pick, at Kempiski. Yeah. <laughs> I hear that kind of a person. As you are young as me, are you that kind of a person? Yeah. Are you ready to let go and feel it in the pain and save that in the next 10 years, as I'm 20, in the next 10 years, where would I be? Where would my uh, family, my generation, people that are going to be under me, where are they going to be? Yeah. So these are a lot of things people have to think. People young as me, as we are talking about young people investing in real estate. And how old, you, how old are you now, Steph? Come again. How old are you now? 23. I turned 23 when, like me. Yeah. If you're not inspired by this, if you're listening to this and you're not inspired by um, Stephanie Wilson's story, please Google her. She's the youngest Ghanaian to enter the real estate as a female. And um, it's extraordinary. And we should be proud, proud of pushing her. Um, and, you know, if there's anybody out there, another young person who's watching this from the diaspora who wants to co um, help and you know be part of her organization and I also feel as you know we say the time is now but the time is now for more partnerships the time is now yeah. for us to, you know not just be working mm -hmm. alone singly, singly but you know coming together as four groups five groups and just merging will be a force to reckon with um, it's not always about whose name is on there but actually mm -hmm. When you come together, you make more of an impact and make more money. So um, that's what advice that I would also give. But Stephanie, thank you so much um, for joining us on the show. You didn't give us your website details. Please um, type it out in the private chat and I'll put it up on the screen for people yes. that want to um, get in touch with Stephanie and her properties that she is also doing. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Take thank care you. and God bless. Wow. I think I'm going yeah. I'm so inspired. <laughs> yeah, I mean, she's, she's, she's 23. Oh, my goodness. I mean. three. And you know what? It's the fact that she understands that there's risk involved. She's willing to go through the... the I mean, it's it's yeah. just... I, I kept getting goosebumps. It's, yeah. it's amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. I'm so proud of her. Yeah, so, you know, again, you're somebody that moved from the diaspora, from, you know, New York. You were you were getting good pay. You didn't have to come back home. Um, and there's a lot of people who are, you know, in the diaspora that are earning, you know, six figures, three, you know, four figures. And they are thinking, why should I come back home? What would your words of encouragement be for those who, you know, is in, is in the back of their mind, but they're still not sure? I think key to moving is to also come and see what's happening on the ground. It's easy to sit on you in your east, um, uh, you know, to sit in New York in your penthouse and think, oh my goodness, this is happening in Ghana or that's bad in Ghana and not really understand how the system works. 
um, there's so much opportunity for everyone. And there's so much opportunity in diverse ways. I was actually just telling someone today that when people think of real estate, they look at built uh, residential buildings and a certain type of residential buildings. I have a friend who has ventured into um, looking at, so I grew up in Tema. And I don't know if you're familiar with Tema, but Tema has a lot of communities that are were well organized and well built in the early you know, in the early days. Now, his vision is to look at certain communities and take roads and streets and see if people are willing to sell their properties, offer them money, and then redevelop it. Because what we call semi-detached houses are now being called what townhouses in, in you know, in, in new parlance. Yeah. His vision is to look at reinventing, um, to, to look at reinvesting in old communities and bringing them up. So there's several areas and you know he's working directly with cdc uh places where p uh, communities where people have actually expired their lease and cannot take it up again so there's several areas of investment there are several ways to look at properties in ghana not only can you be a developer or a homeowner but even as a supporting real estate um group so people who do doors paints whatever so you need to come and muddy the the waters and see what is really down here and then get involved um i'll i'll say to anyone it's not easy it's not going to be a walk in the park yeah. i've made some mistakes i've i've had times when i felt like giving up but giving up is not an option. So you need you need to be here. You need to understand how the system works. And you need to be part of the change in the system. It's very important. We're such smart people, all of us here or abroad. And um, that's one thing that we have as Ghanaians. We're smart. We're intelligent. We're, we're forceful. And we're, we're standing on the shoulders of people who went through the mill. And we need to be part of the change. So... I would say take that bold step and and come and see what's going on. Thank you so much. Thank you, yeah. Um, like I said, we're probably going to have a part two at some point. I will be definitely reaching out to all of you to come back because the questions are many. But thank you so much for your great work that you're doing in Ghana and changing the landscape and, and changing. You too, Denta. You too. Um, keep doing what you're doing. Um, keep you so keep much. soaring. Okay. Some of us, some of us are looking at you from the background and thinking you're going to go places. This is awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, I really appreciate it. So to my own oh, one and only Nana Kia, Nana. Oh my goodness! Even in Ghana, we don't spend this long together. Have you noticed? No, I know. It's like, yeah, this show is just it's just a way to go. Eh? <laughs> But Nana, you know, your your last words to people who are watching, um, people mm -hmm. that, you know, you know, young girls that want to venture into, at, um, into your field, architecture, mm -hmm. and, you know, people that honestly want to buy and get into the field. What are your last words? Yeah, I mean, um, just like the other panelists said, especially for those living outside, I think that's what something I notice. Um, the diasporans rely a lot on documented information to make decisions, yeah. which is a good thing. Um, but we're finding that Ghana is not, all of Ghana is not on paper. Mm. And so um, sometimes uh, after going through, you know, you look at all the reports, so and so put two and two together. And then when they come, they expect it to go the exact same way. Um, unfortunately, Ghana is not 100% on paper. So it helps to come down and assess the system, understand how things work on the ground. Up to now, people don't understand how people like Ghanaians are able to afford imperial homes, and you know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You sure. know, because how much do people even earn in Ghana, you know? But yeah. they are buying houses, $500,000 and all kinds of things. So unfortunately, you can't get it on paper. You need to come down. You need to, you need to engage the people on the ground. It's very important. And beyond that, for me, it is always about going professional. You need to go professional because whether you like it or not, a building is not going to be a cheap venture. It's even if it's an affordable house, it's still money and very likely, you know, quite some savings to put in there. Get the right people and get it right from the start. Too often have we seen people spend money to build a property and, you know, it's not working tomorrow. They are trying to do this here. I mean, come on. 
you spend the money, spend it right, and get it right. Work with professionals. Thankfully, um, all the professionals also have you know, accessible associations that you can go to. In fact, you don't need to even come to me. You can go to, we have an institute called Ghana Institute of Architects. Just go there. Who are the architects in Ghana? So and so pick out who, I mean, like I said from the beginning, how you get one. But work with professionals. I can't overemphasize that. It's important. It will save you in the end, right? Oh, yes. Save you a whole lot. It'll save you money. It'll save you peace of mind. It'll give you peace of mind. <laughs> and uh, time as well. Time and uh, let me say also that the entire you are you are bringing Ghana to the world and we this cannot be overemphasized. You're doing so well. I personally like I I said to my partner I said this girl I don't I don't know you personally like we've only had this small link and you've 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 just experienced my work and I mean you you promote me as though as but really it's just we just know we don't know each other that well but. You know, just because you've seen something, it's Ghanaian, it's made in Ghana, and it's comparable to the rest of the world, you are bringing it as far as you can. And I think it's a good thing you are doing. You have all our support. Thank you so much, sis. Thank you so much. I believe in promoting our own. I believe that, you know, if we all we all have to help each other, you know, if somebody yeah. is doing something and you see that they're doing something really good, you know, promote them. It takes nothing to yeah. promote. Because at the end of the day, we're all pushing Ghana. Um, and um, and that's it for me, really. For me, um, that is what I do. But thank you so much again, Nana, uh, for joining thank us. Thank you so show. much. And thank you to viewers. Oh, what, what did you say, Nana? Thank you to the, the viewers and um, yes, yes, yes. Us, all of them. Yes. And the kind comments. Thank you all. We've seen them. Appreciate okay. it. Thank you. Well, my engineer, Chrissy, is going to officially divorce and kill me, but she loves me, so she won't She won't do that. Because I can see her in the background just like, <laughs> Denta, three hours, three hours. Yes, we've done three hours. And, and three hours because, you know, um, it's an important topic. Um, it's an important discussion. And for us, you know, looking at COVID-19, what are the opportunities for us? And we really need to think about moving back home and investing in back home. If you have seen the survey monkey link that I've just posted, if you are interested in a partner in any of our guests, if you want more information um, on the Stambic Bank, if you want more information on the Greens and Imperial Homes, um, Nanekuya, anything that we have discussed today, please do fill out that form. I can't thank you enough. And again, thank you to Cassie's Classics for these shito and, you know, all seasonings. And thank you so much for Vesta London Beauty. And also thank you to Ahima for this lovely Sankofa um, necklace. Um, you know, you need to go and purchase yours. But yeah, if you haven't already subscribed to um, Odana Network, please click the subscribe button. If you haven't already followed us on Facebook, please follow us. Um, if you want more information on the guests on the show, please make sure that you fill out the form. Thank you so much once again. God bless you all. And I will see you next week. Um, we're going to be talking about tech next week. I have Mary Spio. I have Lucy Quest. Oh, I have an amazing list of guests that will be coming on next week, Thursday. And don't forget, Now Dental Show is going to be every Thursday and every Sunday. I know you can't get rid, you can't get rid of me now. That's it. Thursdays and Fridays. Um, Thursdays and Sundays are booked with Dental. So I will see you next week. Same time. God bless. <laughs>